So here's where you see the hand raised of somebody online. Watch the speed. Are you guys allowing people to speak virtually as well? We have they have to sign up though. Technically, we used to we used to ask for the email, but in the past, it's just going out to them and raise your hand up my invitation to speak. Everyone gets three minutes. You're not three cutting people off. I'm not, unless I mean, I might answer the next two. You can say the same thing. Testing one, two. Okay, mic check. It's
Dr. Dunn, I apologize, but you're muted. Hearing this under emails that we, as an entire board, have received um, and, and had some conversations with folks. And as we move forward tonight, I just want to remind us, everyone, that our mission statement talks about being a part of the community and educating the students. So let's try and come through this vote and still be civil to one another. I just want to say thanks for all the emails we got. Um, I would say, like Gary said, Joey said most of them were good, um, positive feedback, um, laying out your case for what you believe. So we appreciate that. Um, I just hope that we can show the kids who are watching and are going to hear about this, um, how you debate and argue the, the correct way, and then we do it in a professional way. Yes, we can keep it at that table. Okay, we'll go to the next table. Go ahead, put your hand again. Okay, I also received uh, several emails. I want to apologize for not responding uh, at all of them. Uh, I started out trying to really kind of respond all the way. Uh, the number just got to keep it alive. So I did receive it, and uh, I do uh, appreciate all these. But uh, many emails were very, very pleasant. Uh, some, I have to say, uh, were, were not very good. Uh, I do hope that you can continue. Uh, having positive communication. Uh, no, we all have common goals to participate. I think we did. We participated in this group. I also have one email that I've asked to read. Yeah, you can turn the mic towards your mouth a little bit. Yeah, bend it. Bend a little bit like okay. that. There you go. Uh, I do have one email also that I was asked to read, um, particularly from from community uh, from Matt Bull. I'm writing to encourage you to vote for masks and social distancing, at least for elementary students who will not be eligible for COVID vaccination when school starts this fall. Positive COVID tests have increased dramatically in the past month and are predicted to continue to do so for the month's bottom. The T variant is very contagious and typically makes the person sicker than earlier measures. The children deserve all the protection available to support their continued participation in learning. Please don't let us down. Thank you for your support in this matter. Sincerely, Pat As I said before, uh, I received uh, many emails, uh, some poor mass, some mass. I appreciate uh, every single one. I tried to read them all. And uh, I thank you for your emails. Um, I have uh, many questions, which I hope to answer throughout the course of this. So, Thank you for all the time. We've got the biggest crowd I've seen in the last couple of time. Thank you for that. We're on the same board as everybody else I've received. Many, many emails. Very well crafted. We did not comply. Giving a lot of reply at the point. But again, very many well got emails from both sides. It's a good and good way. Let's put on it where you stand. I'm trying to get all sides. I think that that's something we can do that tonight. Uh, 
Okay, thank you. Uh, I also received uh, many emails and phone calls, so uh, thank you for that. Um, I did, I, I have promised uh, in the past that if you cannot attend the meeting and would like your comments read aloud, that I would do that for you. And we just had a couple here that, uh, well, uh, I think about five, with very short comments. So I am going to do these people the honor and read them aloud. First is by Amy Kiski at Merrill Point. When our family left the district last year, it was not an effort to prioritize safety and consistency. We look forward to returning and value the safety of our community. I am a parent with elementary, middle, and high school age children. At the end of each day, when we come back together, our risks are shared. I am writing to ask the Middle Point School Board to implement universal masking throughout our district. Furthermore, I ask that you outline safety protocols and procedures so that parents can make informed decisions about registration for this school year. Next is by Amy and Matt Benish at Mineral Point. I urge the board to vote to have mandatory masks in all school buildings and to follow a layered safety approach for our students in the fall. It appears that the practices were put in place in the spring were successful, and as it is clear, the goal of all board members and community members is to have students safely in school with as few disruptions as possible. It would only make sense to require masks. Next is Stacey Bowden of Narrow Point. I want to express my support for our school board to follow the recommendations of the local medical and public health professionals for COVID protections. Currently, this means masking up. In the event these recommendations change, I support a change. I sincerely hope that our board looks to the experts in this decision rather than power or who may speak the loudest. Much like in our schools, we want everyone to be given the space to be heard. I am hopeful that this is also practiced in the meeting tonight as this topic is discussed and that equal space and time is given to all members to express different perspectives. Next is by Haley and John Webking of Narrow Point. We are excited to join the Mineral Point Elementary community this year. Our son will be entering first grade and he can't wait to be back in school. That being said, we want the school board to follow the recommendations of local medical and public health professionals for later COVID protections, including masking at schools this fall. We feel this is the best way to keep our kids in school and the most vulnerable members of our community healthy. And lastly, this is from Chris and Sherry Underwood of Mineral Point. We want the school board to follow the recommendations of local medical and public health professionals for layered COVID protections, including masking in schools this fall. As parents of a young child who will be entering middle point school in a few years, it is important for us to know that the school board makes decisions in the best interest of the students and children, including following appropriate guidelines for their health and safety. Okay, thank you for that. Yeah, thank you. We have some people standing in back. Uh, we have some room in the front here. And if uh, anyone could, if anyone from, from facilities is here, can put out a few more chairs. I think they would appreciate that. Okay, next we're going to enter the, uh, the uh, citizen communications public comment period. Um, before we start, I just want to just lay a few ground rules, rules on how this is going to work for those of you who haven't done this before. And uh, this is straight out of our uh, Mineral Point Board policy on public participation at board meetings. So um, uh, please bear with me, but I think the comments are relevant to, uh, to tonight's proceedings. So the, just so you know, the policy refers to uh, the speaker as a registrant. So when I say registrant, I mean the person, the, the citizen who wants to make, make a comment. Each registrant shall adhere to established procedures for the public comment period, and he or she shall, shall, number one, retain all liability for his or her comments and conduct, i.e. the public comment period does not offer any speaker any exemption from legal liability or from other lawful consequences that may result from the speaker's comments or conduct. Number two, wait to speak until he or she has been recognized by the presiding officer, which apparently is me. Uh, limit the substance of his or her comments to the topic that are within the scope of the public comment period. Number four, 
limit the duration of his or her comments to the allotted period of time. Number five, avoid engaging in conduct or making comments that are obscene, threatening, harassing, defamatory, or disorderly. Number six, avoid making repetitive appearances before the board in which the same registrant or persons acting in concert present substantially the same information. Number seven, avoid engaging in political advocacy with respect to candidates for any elected office. Number eight, present their remarks verbally without the use of supporting material that requires any setup or taking up time. Number nine, except where a person registers under established procedures as a spokesperson for a group or where it is permitted as a reasonable accommodation for an individual with special needs, no individual may present his or her public comments by proxy. Next, uh, to promote the lawful, orderly, and efficient progress of each meeting, the presiding officer of the meeting shall have the authority to enforce the requirements of this policy, and he shall conduct any period of public comment according to established procedures. The presiding officer may call on any registrant to order and direct the individual to cease conduct which violates any applicable law, policy, or procedure if necessary. Sorry, period. If necessary, the presiding officer may terminate a registrant's comments and or contact law enforcement for assistance in maintaining order and safe or safety. Hopefully I don't have to do any of that. If the presiding officer directs a registrant to cease his or her remarks before his or her allotted time has expired, the registrant may immediately appeal the decision to the body, uh, the school board, for a final decision. In particularly egregious situations, the presiding officer or, or any board member may propose a sanction that extends beyond the current meeting, and the sanction, if any, shall be determined by a vote of the board. And lastly, time limits. The standard allotted time for a public comment shall be a maximum of three minutes per individual speaker. However, after the first 10 registrants have addressed the board, the board may designate by motion or by showing of unanimous consent a maximum of two minutes per individual speaker. Where any registrant is acting as a designated spokesperson for a group of three or more named individuals who are also present at the meeting, the group spokesperson's otherwise allotted time will be extended by two minutes. So that will be three minutes plus two minutes for a total of five minutes. To the extent any registrant addresses the board for less than his or her maximum allotted time, the registrant is not permitted to reserve the remainder or donate his or her remaining time to another speaker. Okay. Thank you for that. Now we will go to the sign up list. If you, uh, if I call your name, please step up to the podium here in the middle of the room. Uh, Mr. Wainwright said the microphone is on, and uh, um, Angie will keep uh, your three minute a lot of time and let you know when you're, when you say, Angie, when there's 30 seconds left or 10 seconds left, something like that. Okay. All right, first up is Jenny Walleen. Good evening. My name is Jenny Walleen and I teach Spanish at the high school. I'm here tonight to urge the school board to continue the mask optional protocol for the upcoming school year. This has been a very polarizing subject, especially on local social media pages. No matter what the school board decides tonight, I urge people to be kind to one another, both in person and online. According to the CDC website, in the school year 2019-2020, 434 children died of influenza in the U.S. Last year, that number was 188. So over a two-year period, school year period, the number of children who died of the flu was 622. That number actually shocked me because you rarely hear of children dying of the flu. In contrast, COVID-19 deaths for children in the U.S. for 2019-2020 school year was 124. And in the last school year, it was 213 for a total of 337. It goes without saying that any death is tragic and devastating for that family. After looking at the CDC numbers, it would appear that the flu is twice as deadly as COVID-19 when it comes to children. So where does that leave us? I believe it should be up to the parents to decide if they want their child to wear a mask to school. They may choose to mask due to no vaccination yet for youngsters under age 12. 
They may choose to mask even though their child is vaccinated. They may choose to mask due to special health considerations, either for their child or family members. After seeing the CDC information, it appears that the flu should be more of a health concern for school-aged children. And as long as I've been around, we haven't mandated masks during the flu season. Thank you for your time. Next is Ingrid Bird. And I just want to remind the speakers to please state your name and your residence. Good evening. My name is Ingrid Bird. I live with my family in Mineral Point. I'm the parent of a high schooler, family physician, and work in Upland Hills as a hospital doctor. I've been taking care of COVID patients for more than one year and continue to do so. There are currently patients in Upland Hills today who are suffering and struggling with COVID. I have watched COVID-19 patients die from their disease. My colleagues and I have been wearing masks to protect ourselves and prevent the spread of, of disease for our entire careers. I've worn them when delivering babies in the operating room and during cold and flu season when patients test positive for virus, such as influenza. Human history has always been closely linked with infectious disease. During World War I, the influenza outbreak killed millions worldwide. Even in my own career, I have witnessed more than just this epidemic. In the fall of 2014, there was an outbreak of enterovirus, another respiratory virus, which impacted primarily children nationwide. At that time, I wore a mask to protect myself and others when taking care of these children in the hospital. We cannot always predict when these crises will occur, but we are neither helpless nor without choices. Please accept that this COVID-19 pandemic is real and that infectious disease has always been part of humanity's struggle. Please do not saddle our children with a legacy of regret, a lifetime wondering if their actions and behaviors might have led to the spread of illness, harm to others, and devastation to local families, including our teachers and other school employees. Our children are too young to shoulder this burden, and we cannot predict if our own children might become sick enough to require hospitalization. Please choose acceptance of this difficult time, even if making any peace with it is challenging. Please gravitate toward compassion. Please embrace love. Please require our children to wear masks in schools and please model that behavior yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Jenny Pete. My name is Jenny Keith, and my husband and I reside on County Q in the Point School District. Earlier today, I shared an email with major things used by the Shelford, Belmont, Cuba City, and River Valley Schools in regard to their COVID policies. They were pulled directly from school websites and sent to our board and administration today. It is a tiered approach with protocol changing as the positive cases with the students and our staff within our school change. I have made some copies of just one of them. They're all similar. And I do have somebody passing a few of them around if anyone is interested. This chart speaks to a whole gamut of precautions, not just masking. It covers physical distancing, cohorting, testing, vaccination, hand hygiene, cleaning, isolation, and quarantine. We can choose to adopt part or all of a system like this. Last year, we heard a lot about how we need to keep our kids safe and give them consistency. Some families have gone all summer without masks, and others have gone all summer masking up and it has since this all started last spring. And that's okay. However, I do feel it is confusing and scary for a kid that hasn't had to wear a mask since last May. Now, I do think that children will understand masking up when cases are high, and I also think it's important to point out that just because I'm asking for masking to potentially be part of this matrix, that doesn't mean that I or anybody else may not choose to mask our children.
asked her what they would do. My six-year-old said, no, I don't want to. And my eight-year-old was up in the air. And I told her that's okay. I respect her decision and she needs to respect everybody else's as well. I think adopting an approach like I suggested would give people on both sides of this issue some type of a win. It's a compromise. It's a tiered approach. Approach like this, in the very least in regards to the hot button topic of masking. I also believe that we should consider our two buildings separate. That way, if there's an outbreak at the elementary, it doesn't have to change the status of the high school. This is the approach that Cuba City is taking as they have multiple buildings. It is the choice like this that would eliminate the need for a special meeting every time we feel the tide is changing and we need to change the policy. I ask you to please consider this compromise. And I also want to address everybody else here. I know not everybody is comfortable speaking, but if anybody does agree with what I am saying in making masks optional or adopting a matrix success, I ask you to stand for a moment to show the board the support. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Next is Mike Cabot. Uh, thank you, uh, Mike Cabot for 320 Copper Street, Mineral Point. Uh, what I have here is an email that I wrote up this morning, but I didn't have time to get it out to, uh, to the board. So that's what, uh, what I'm going to be reading here. Dear Mineral Point board members and administration, I'm writing to ask you to keep our mask welcome policy in place. This plan allows parents to decide for their own families what is best for them. It gives us a choice in the way our kids receive their education. As a parent, coach, and husband to a teacher and coach at the point, I know firsthand how restricted masks are in delivering instruction. Teachers and coaches have, have a much harder time delivering instructions last message and kids have a much harder time receiving the information they are being given. For most kids, being able to see the teacher's mouth and facial expressions are just as important as being able to hear the teacher clearly. I know tonight there will be a vote on, on whether to universally mask everyone in the district buildings. I am asking that this be voted down and that we remain mask welcome or optional until staff, administration, parents and the rest of the community are, are allowed to evaluate what our numbers look like after we've had kids in buildings. I don't want to dwell in the past, but we need to learn from it. About this time last year, I've been not always approved for the start of the 2020 school, uh, school year. The goal of this plan was to keep our kids open, keep our schools open longer and kids in school than other districts in the area and keep the kids If you, were, if you were to look back on the days in school, what actually happened was Mineral Point was one of the first schools to shut down. If you were to look back and measure the days in school, Mineral Point School District had some of the lowest amounts of school in person. At Mineral Point, there were many grades that never got more than 15 to 20 days in person learning in the first semester. Why do I bring this up? It's my opinion that when you start to start with such strict guidelines as we did last year, it's too hard to get it back to a more normal style of education. Just like keeping most kids home for three to four days a week last year, forcing everyone to wear a mask is the same principle this year. If the ability to go to school with the choice of wearing a mask is our goal. I use the word choice because that is what this is about. An example of choice that just happened in our school last week was a sixth grade orientation. I attended it with my son. As I thanks, Mike. Can I finish? You can finish your last sentence. Can I feel? Or members? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I know Larry. 
Okay, so what I'm, what I'm doing is I'm enforcing the three month, the three minute time period for each speaker according to board policy. Then if you want to speak more than that, you appeal to the board just like you did, and then I get unanimous consent. That sound good, Larry? Okay. So we have a speaker appeal to the board to speak over his three minutes. Can I get you any unanimous consent from the board? That's fine. Okay. Okay, you, you want to set a limit on the time period? I, 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 uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay, we do not have unanimous consent. Uh, for the appeal, so I'll entertain a motion to so uh, I'll take a motion to uh, approve the appeal uh, for this person's time, and if you can set an amount of extra time you want to award the speaker, and then we can vote on it. Correct. Correct. Okay, motion from Member Steppes to give the speaker 90 seconds to finish. Uh, do I have a second? Second from Member Skelly. Okay, a roll call, Angie. Yes. 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 Thank you. Okay, Thank you for passes. Go ahead. 90 seconds, sir. Okay, here we go. Uh, as I walked in, I wondered how, uh, what would the see with masks into the gym? Uh, I didn't count, but uh, going into it, but then they brought the kids down. Uh, they brought roughly, I asked my wife, roughly in sixth grade, there's 60 kids. I counted 10 kids with masks. I did a simple math, but the 60 number is 100% accurate. It's about 17.5%. So if we argue 15 to 20%, of the kids were wearing masks. That also represented what I saw in the stands and the, and the bleachers of the parents that were with them. There were even some kids that were wearing masks, but their parents were wearing masks. The whole thing with this is about choice, right? And, and, and doing what the majority wants. 15 to 20% of our population chose to wear masks that day. The other 80 to 85% chose not to wear masks that day. I think it's important that the elected board does what the majority wants the, uh, the people in school want them to do. That's what they were elected for. Thank you for your time and the extension. Thanks, Mike. Next is Brent Eisenberger. Good evening. My name is Brian Iceberg. Back when COVID started, I think rallying cry was to follow the science. Somehow that must have changed, or perhaps only portions of science seem to matter. As of the latest update from the CDC, the infection fatality ratio of COVID in the age range, age range of 0 to 17 is 0.0002%. The IFR from seasonal flu, as we heard from another speaker earlier, is exponentially higher. The science has shown that students are not significant factors in the spread of COVID-19. Schools are not significant breeding grounds for COVID-19. Numerous schools have gone mass optimal for varying lengths of time before tonight, and they have not had most massive outbreaks that people fear. This makes sense as children in schools participate mass-free by their choice of the community outside of school. The science also, however, shows the effect of masking and social distancing and what that has done for our children. As we know, humans are social creatures and social skills are primarily developed during our youth. Lack of interaction with others is extremely harmful. In fact, on May 25th, 2021, the Office of Children's Mental Health has stated that in the last year, children committing acts of self-harm doubled. Wisconsin now ranks fifth in the United States for self-harm among ages 6 to 22. DHS in the state of Wisconsin has admitted that school policies and social distancing is to blame. 
My question for the board is who here has asked or surveyed any of the student body of their mental health status? Why is COVID more important than the mental and social well being of our children? Based on the signs of the Based on the science, it's in the best interest to maintain or approve masking out. As I'm sure some of you have heard right now, various members of the community have reached out to me as I'm an attorney that was a law firm to represent them. I will not, not discuss this rumor, but I do have a message for the board as it relates to masking in school. I have significant experience in this area to include in from the Wisconsin State Supreme Court. I can tell you, should you mask be required, there will still need to be exemptions. If a parent wanted to apply, to apply for an exemption protected, say, under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, it's extremely easy for them to do, and I would be more than willing to help them. Not only can I get masks off of students regardless of what you say tonight, I can also create a legal minefield for you to navigate. And I know you have your own attorney here tonight, to, and perhaps they can address them. I've represented people with similar issues from grade schools to colleges and universities, many of which have ended in confidential settlements. I've represented staff from colleges to universities that also have resulted in confidential settlements. Although I'm proud of securing these victories for my clients, I know that it's completely unnecessary. And not only that, but it depletes resources from schools that should be used somewhere else. I ask that if you do not wish to follow the science, then you consider the resources that will be exhausted fighting the same fight I have done in districts throughout the state. If I can have 30 seconds to finish, I have two more sentences. Okay, there's been basically you 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 appealed for more time. So we had a motion from member Stemis for 60 more seconds. Do I have a second? Okay, second from Sullivan. Roll call, please. Yes. Can you please state your residence? Sure, somewhere in Wisconsin. Okay, thank you. Finally, nobody here today is arguing to forcibly remove masks from individuals or mandate that masks are not allowed. If individuals want to wear masks, then they should be able to. If they don't want to wear masks, then they should be able to as well. I'm sure that you have talked with your attorney and you know the authority of the board to create these policies. That is never something I have challenged. However, I will challenge. If there's a client going to, and I'm pretty confident there are, the ability or how to enforce this. And I know that I've talked most about masks, but quarantine, I ask your attorney to welcome to the Americans with Disability Act, how that protects confidential records. Because if we treat quarantine differently based on vaccination status, that is another legal minefield you all are walking into. Thank you. Next is Glenn Pinch. Just a reminder to please say your name and residence before you start and do your best to be respectful for a three minute time. We we do want to have an actual board discussion and, and to be able to vote on this before the end of the night. Appreciate it. My name is Glenn A. Kinch, South Road Park Road, North Point. I'd like to validate the information they've given on the regular flu and the COVID. Now, uh, I learned some time ago that uh, the little virus is 0.3 microns. He can crawl through your oil filter. I also looked up CDC's tests on mass. They've done a series of them from 1946 to 2018, and I wouldn't believe any of them have come out the last two years. During that time, the conclusion of all those tests was that masks were of no use to prevent the virus. That's from the CDC. Now, as far as buildup of carbon dioxide behind the mask, the Germans had a large test. I think it was 26,000 people. And after a certain period of time with children, they found that the buildup 
carbon dioxide was six and a half times what their allowed limit in a confined room was. The other point I'd like to make is I don't know how many of you realize what went on in Sweden when we were running and hiding in our rooms and uh, wearing our mask and whatever. They didn't do anything. They didn't have any problems with COVID epidemics in their schools. And actually the teachers had a lower incidence of COVID-19 than the general populace. Well, the whole problem is that we've been, been fed propaganda and I have members of my own family that swallowed it. And uh, it's, it's pretty easy to be afraid and I don't want to chastise anybody for, for if you want to wear a mask, that's fine. I don't want to wear one because I know that it's futile. And I'll you wear yours and I'll not wear mine. Thank you. Thank you. This is Mike Mitchell. Mike Mitchell, Mineral Point used to be on the board. I'm glad I'm not on there now. I appreciate what you're doing. This is not an easy job. I'm up here as much for the children that are in school now as I am for the ones who went through and that I raised. Particularly one, my daughter Molly. She's a pediatric ICU nurse in Minneapolis. She's treating young children with COVID now. She's treating teenagers with COVID now. And the beds are becoming full. She knows what it is firsthand. I'm not a doctor. I sell floor covering, used to. People would come to me for information on floor covering. I tell them because that's what I do. I go to doctors, I go to people who do this for a living to tell us what is the best thing to do. We're just concerned as past school board members for the utmost safety of the children. And I'm here for the, the, the mass protocol on there just to be on the safe side. If I'm wrong, maybe nobody will get sick. If it goes the other way, maybe some people will get sick. Just err on the side of caution. And I would hope Doc, if something happened to me, you came to see me in the hospital, you'd be wearing your hands. Appreciate it. I know it's a hard job. Good luck. Thanks, man. Next is Alan Schrein. Alan Schrein. 325 Bodhi Street, City of Mineral Point, lived here 14 years. Uh, Doreen and I have a daughter, Sylvie. She was in the fourth day last year. She's currently five years old. She's going to be going into kindergarten. I don't have any fancy notes or anything to help, but I just want to let the board's observations that my daughter told me and I've observed over the last year for being in 4K. The mask thing has been extremely difficult for her, emotionally, socially, and education wise. Uh, we told her she had to go to school, she's got to wear a mask. That's the policy that you all decide. She'll do it, but she struggles with it. Uh, as far as uh, not seeing her teachers uh, when they're talking and stuff like that, she struggles with that as well. Uh, we've asked her uh, since she's five years old, we feel that she can make a decision if she wants to wear a mask or not. We ask her if she wants to wear one. She doesn't want to wear it again, it's her choice. Uh, she went to summer school for three weeks in July, and Doreen and I noticed a significant change just in those three weeks when the mask was optional. She didn't have to wear a mask. Uh, she comes home, she's more social, she's learning more. The interaction with uh, other kids in the neighborhood and such is much better. She can see their faces, she can interact with them, um, and so on. Uh, the other part of it is that. Uh, she wants to come to school, but we've also, Green and I, both uh, discussed the option of open at home. There's other parents in the community that I've talked to, one parent in particular, that has three kids. They're open enrolling from the district because they're going to a private school where it's their choice. They can choose to wear a mask if they want to, but if they don't want to have to wear a mask, they don't have to. Now, this afternoon, I spoke to a school board. I said, it's my understanding this is a public school that kids go to. And uh, it's my understanding that we get funding from the state. And if they aren't coming to the school, 
the school is going to lose funding. Well, how do we make that up? Are the taxpayers to pay for that? Or who's going to pay for that if you don't have enrollment in your school because there's uh, kids that are leaving that are wearing masks? Um, I don't have anything else other than that. We're considering taking our daughter and uh, taking her to another school, open enrolling, where she doesn't have to wear a mask because after all, it's their choice. I appreciate all you guys on the school board for everything you're doing. Uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. This is Scott America. Scott, read the State Road uh, 23 downhill. I wish I had a good icebreaker for this, but I don't. The State Board members, it is our job as parents to demand a better world for our children, lead by example, by being engaged with four citizens. It is, an alarming, it is alarming to see how divided our, our community has become. And regardless of your social limbs, it is increasingly important to be willing to have dialogues that ultimately lead to the realization that we have an amazing community. Here in rural Wisconsin, we are blessed with beautiful countryside and good neighbors, but that by no means correlates to being immune to the spread of the pandemic. We seem to have a small sense of security here in the countryside. This is not an urban versus rural issue. When a storm hits, it doesn't appear to ruin farm fields or condominiums. This, this pandemic is no different. I am not pro mask, but I am pro community. And the only proven method to slow the transmission of this virus and safeguard our community is universal masking. We need to put our faith into our medical professionals and data. We are all tired of COVID-19, and the only pathway to normalcy is through hearing, is, is, is hearing, excuse me, is through adhering to these guidelines. As a dairy farmer, my team and I take great pride in keeping our country fed during these troubling times. Now it's time for all of us to take great pride in our community and do our civic duty of stopping this virus. The longer we swap over the validity, validity of science-based evidence, we're only prolonging the effects of this virus. Maybe COVID-19 hasn't affected you or your loved ones, and I pray it never does. If we don't all unite, it is us who will ultimately pay the price. Our healthcare professionals are integral parts of our community. They are on our school boards, they volunteer our free clinic, and above all, our friends and neighbors. This pandemic needs to be addressed by our healthcare, our, excuse me, our healthcare experts, and we all have the civic responsibility to heed their guidance because they are not politicians trying to win a popularity contest, but the people we depend on to keep us and our loved ones safe. The partisan lines over how to handle this pandemic will be remembered by history as a tremendous blunder. I urge each of us to do our part so we can return to life as normal sooner rather than later. Thank you for your service, board members. Thank you. John Broderick. Hey, my name is John Broderick. I'm a parent of Hill, he's a junior in high school, and I'm in first year. I have a short quote. If you have to be persuaded, reminded, Pressure, lied to, incentivized, coerced, bullied, socially shamed, guilt tripped, threatened, punished, and eventually criminalized. If this is considered necessary to gain your compliance, you can be absolutely certain that what is promoted is not in your best interest. This is from Ian, Wood, Ian Watson, who is a science fiction writer, ironically, because in my opinion, a lot of these protocols are fictional science. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. To the board, we now reach a, uh, the, the predetermined maximum of 10 speakers. And now I'd like to invite the board to make a motion of how to proceed moving forward. You can um, elect to uh, approve all remaining uh, speakers on the list, which totals seven, sorry, eight. Um, and you can also specify whether to reduce the allotted time from three minutes to two minutes, um, according to board policy. I, I, I will make a motion to allow most of that. 
Yes. Okay. We have a motion from Member Sullivan. Three minutes, a lot of time. We have a motion from Member Sullivan to allow the remaining uh, eight speakers uh, with three minutes, a lot of time. We'll have a second. Okay, second from Member Genetka. Um, and just for the sake of discussion, is there anyone online who plans on making uh, a comment? It's like we have one, two, Please use your raise your hand icon. Three. Again, if you'd like to speak from off uh, from virtually, please raise your hand with the raise your hand icon. Going once, going twice. Okay, we have three. Uh, okay. So we have additional people wishing to speak. Okay, so one, two, anyone else? Raise your hand. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So technically we should we should amend the motion to include all the work. I want to make sure, I'm oh, sorry, Gary, I want to make sure that you want to where you go. <laughs> Gary, so we now went from 8 to 13. You want to keep your motion as is? Yes. Okay. All right, so we have a motion and second to allow all our evening speakers, both virtually and in person, for three minutes each. Okay. Uh, Bob, did you second that? Are you okay with the new motion to accept that? The current amount of speakers that would be for the Justin number. Okay. Andy? Yes. 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 With word approval. With word approval. Sure. Uh, yeah, I'm just trying to follow board policy. Yeah. I'm just following the board's direction on how long you want to follow period to see. Yes. Okay. 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 Motion passes. Thank you for your patience on that. Um, next up is Teresa Osborne. Forgive me if I am mispronouncing anybody's name. I'm Teresa Orsburn, and I would like to give my time to the lawyer from Sun Prairie. I'm sorry, Teresa, you cannot donate your time to anybody. Okay, then I'll go with that. Okay. Probably not as good. <laughs> um, there's, there's kind of an elephant in the room that nobody seems to ever talk about, and I'd like to talk about ivermectin and hydrochloroquine. And I think that would take care of a lot of this problem. And uh, those are things that help with COVID, we've heard. And um, with all the unvaccinated thousands of people coming into our country, I feel like it's really not fair to muzzle our children when people are coming in, they're not even vaxxed. So, this is Thank you. Next is Claire Pilardo. Hi, my name is Claire Pilardo, and um, I live in Mineral Point, Wisconsin. Um, first, I'd like to start off by saying I have two young children. One is um, going into sixth grade and one is going into second grade. And we actually chose to pull our kids from Mineral Point and open and roll them to Belmont this last um, year. And actually, the school board decision today is actually going to determine whether we do that again this year. Um, we wanted our children to be in school. We didn't want our kids to have to wear masks. Um, and at this point, 
um, we would prefer and would like it to be optional. Um, obviously, we feel that parents should be able to choose what's best for their own children. Um, but the bottom line is that we feel that the statistics that show that, um, you know, like somebody had spoke about earlier with the flu, um, children are much more high risk from the flu and mortality rates are higher from the flu, and we've never asked for children in the past uh, the way that we have this last um, year or two. And I understand that at the beginning, everybody was afraid and they didn't know what was right. But unfortunately, a lot of the data people are seeing out there and the data on the news isn't necessarily accurate. Um, children are not super spreaders. Um, they actually show that the RO for children is actually below one, meaning it's mathematically impossible for children to, for them to drive this epidemic um, based on multiple contact tracing studies. Um, In the UK, actually, for Delta um, has come and gone. Hospitalization rates were 50% lower with Delta, so it shows that there's not necessarily an increase um, in hospitalizations or issues with Delta variant. Um, children, nobody's talking about the fact that these masks are filthy and that they have they carry bacteria. Um, dentists are complaining about issues with the children's teeth. Um, There's illnesses that are occurring with the masks. The um, studies in Germany have shown that there's numerous bacteria and um, including meningitis on these masks that um, children are wearing just for a six hour period during the day. It's not something that's building masks every day. It's literally something that was brand new and just worn for six hours. Um, people are not addressing that as well. Um, I just feel that um, as a whole, as a parent, you should be given the option to do what is best for you and for your children. And that's not telling people they can't wear masks if they're uncomfortable and then with that, but we should all as parents be given the option to do what's best for our own children. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Christina White, South Hill, Penn State Road 23. I have three young kids in the school district, nine, seven, and five. And in my opinion, masks dehumanize people. There's already a major issue with bullying, and I think having masks is only going to intensify that. When a child cannot see physically that they hurt somebody, it's going to become easier to make fun of that person. Picking on others. You cannot truly really see that effect with your face half covered. So much human emotion and learning comes through facial expressions and the shapes that your lips make. A couple of my children are learning to read, and it becomes increasingly difficult to help them along with their reading journey without their teachers being able to physically show them how to make the sounds and put words together. With all that said, I can respect the parents that choose to have their kids wear a mask. And I am asking for the respect for me to choose not to have my kids wear masks. That is simply all I'm asking. This is Bob May. I'm Bob May. I live out on County Road. Uh, please don't anybody tell my mom if I do a bad job up here tonight. She tried to get me to do public speaking in high school and I didn't do it. So, but that being said, uh, the one thing I would say about this, what's really uh, uplifting about this whole meeting, I, I, I had it in my mind 20 different things I was going to say tonight. Sometimes I was angry, sometimes I wasn't angry at all. Um, I'd like to thank the board for allowing us to talk. Of course, you do work for us. I mean, that is kind of your job. But I say that in respect, but I do appreciate the job you're letting us talk today. Uh, but I go back again to what I said about the respect. I've heard three or four people speak here tonight that don't agree with anything what I said or what I believe. That everybody clapped for them. There was no jeering. There was nothing. And, uh, you know, I've been informed a little earlier today that Bill was asked to be here. That's a little bit insulting to me that 
that we as community members here that somebody thinks that we're going to uplift this place because maybe somebody doesn't listen to us. So I'm a little bit insulted by that. But that being said, I got a couple of questions. You don't have to answer them now, but I do want them answered. And I don't want you, Dr. Dunn, to think it's a personal attack on you, but you are a doctor. Um, I want to know why, we, and, and Dr. Fox, I attended, a, I attended a school board meeting here a couple of times ago. I never heard the word hyper, hypercapnia. I never heard the word depression. And God help us, I never heard anything about the word suicide. I never heard anything promoting people to take D3 and saying, you can go to Walmart and get it. I bought some today to build the immune system of these kids. Instead, we were back them up and, and mask them up. Well, my biggest inspiration, Dr. Fox, came from you in the last school board meeting. And here's what God said. Uh, Terry, the bus driver, I don't know your last name, I apologize. She spoke at a school board meeting and she said what really goes on on the bus before these kids go to school. Dr. Fox, and, and, she, and I say this in all due respect, but you did inspire me by something you said, and I think you all ought to listen to this. So I brought, I brought, Terry brought up what goes on on the bus with these unmasked kids before they ever get to school. Now I know that's good window dressing when they get here. We all throw them masks up. Everybody can see them with a mask on. She wanted to tell what goes on on the bus, but she was kind of shut down, quite honestly, okay? When I got to speak, I brought up the point that the CDC reported that through the vaccine, and I know you're thinking, we're not talking about vaccines, hear me out. So I said that there was at least a thousand cases of young men and adolescents that suffered from extreme heart inflammation due to the shock. Dr. Fox, if I'm correct, you verified that, correct? And, and, and those numbers may not be exact. I'm not trying to put not, it uh, just, just finish your comment. Just finish your comment. I am finishing. We're not going to have a back and forth. Okay. At any rate, well, she can verify. She gave me the inspiration. We'll verify it. Her, the thoughts, her thought was that she said that she thought it was worth the risk to vaccinate her kids uh, up against all the people that had been vaccinated. And I don't disagree with her. I respect her opinion. But I think it needs to carry the other way. No, I think you need to respect the parents that don't want to go that route and don't want their kids masked. Thank you. Next is Rachel Bergstrom. Hi there, my name is Rachel Bergstrom. I'm not going to have the mic up enough. I have two kids um, right on my school. And I think, again, we support it. We did some delivery. Um, but also just to add a community component of kind of being able to see together and it's really hard to know that my kids desperately need to be in school with them. We love them, but they need to be in school um, for all of our students. And thinking about the mental health component, how important that is, that's true and valid and really, really important. There's also the physical health component, and I think the long, the long term community investment we can make each other and saying, okay, one of my kids what, like, actually likes wearing a mask, but that's interesting, the other really doesn't. So, thinking about bullying and pressure and all of that, regardless of any kind of underlying health condition, it's really hard to convince a kid to do the thing that they want to do and other people aren't. And so I was thinking about how we consistently get with this virus when it continues to be able to continue to be I think the last thing that I'll just add is my dad would just say, you can't be the guy at his job. And he had five daughters, so now he says you can't be the woman at her job either. Um, but thinking about how do we pay attention to the scientists. Not, like, I'm not an armchair scientist. I can read all sorts of statistics and I think I'm pretty smart and I'm well educated, but I'm not a doctor and I'm not a medical professional. It just pay attention to all the guidance that's out there, even our own county guidance. They're not, you know, it's not people running for elections. I feel people who know their crap. So I just really appreciate that we could pay attention to what they have to say and listen to them. I just want to ask the future of this insight and system of recognize. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Bill Keith. I'm sorry, I can't read your handwriting, your last name. Can you just uh, state your full name of your residence? Appreciate your time. Hello, Thank you, sir. I have a recent 
condition to the community and to the life with my family. I'm going to talk to you today as a concerned grandfather of a child who will be in my first grade about one of the issues I feel is important for you to have in order to make an informed decision concerning this generation's future. First, I need to give you a little background about me. 50 years ago, I served in the military as a security information analyst and afterwards was a government account manager for the largest scientific, technical, and medical publisher in the world. As part of my training, I was taught to critically examine information to find more flaws or incorrect data, which might be contained within that material. The material I am giving you tonight, which is not my opinion, is what I have discovered in going through thousands of scientific literary materials and viewing videos from credentialed, credible authorities whose findings I have no reason to question or doubt. Two articles highlight the reasons I come to the conclusions I wish to share with you is they both rely upon actual scientific evidence as opposed to politically motivated something. No problem. Sorry about that. Everyone at home, please uh, do your theater. Thank you. As opposed to politically motivated assumptions lacking any real medical or scientific evidence. When one is evaluating information, mutual practice is to use the most reliable method available. Two of the most common of these methods are trials, which fall into two categories observational trials or randomized control trials or RCTs. The latter group employs comparison of variables with the control group to verify the conclusion reached. It's evident from reading the CDC's online website that public health and other officials rely heavily upon only observational trials. The glaring flaw with observational trials is the lack of any control group for comparison, which results in a flawed conclusion unprovable upon investigation, assumptions over factual evidence. Since COVID, basically for the last 18 months, studies were used to justification by the CDC, which had extremely strong or isolated examples of subjects, not a wide range of participants one might normally expect to see in such trials. In fact, the CDC has attacked one larger study conducted in Denmark as too small with almost 5,000 participants which, fun fact, is almost 50 times larger than the participants upon which they are facing their current recommendations. The Denmark study... Bill, you've reached your allotted three minutes. Would you like to appeal for more time? Sure, I would. Do you know how much time it's going to take to read what you have? About less than two. Okay. Okay, we've had a motion from Member Stevens to allow the speaker to have two more minutes. Can I have a second? And second from Member Skelding. Roll call for Angie. Or from Angie, please. Yes. 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 Okay. Two minutes, Bill. Thank you. And the Denmark study concluded that there was only 0.3% difference between the infection rate in the control group and the mass group, making the difference statistically insignificant. Yesterday, I received an email from another renowned doctor also citing these two same studies. One thing I would like to point out is that the doctor, the original doctor, by this is sort of a practice in New Mexico. He self described as an evidence based research. And what he said was one thing that they collected from the two hairstylists and 124 bleaching household, and a self reported outbreak on board the USS Theodore Roosevelt from 382 Navy people while they were at sea. That's the kind of information the CBC wants you to rely upon for their recommendations about masking. Are you willing to trust the guidance on such small evidence? There's also evidence that not only were these people wrong, they knew it was wrong, and they pushed it forward anyway. 
In addition to the funding debate in the past year, you have a lot of other educated learning of the risk of developments in sociological issues connected to mass wearing. Much has been said in interviews typically the highlight of COVID effect of wearing masks as upon children's development, especially younger children, when seeing the entire facial expression expression of others is so vital to learning reactions and social life. Please consider not trying to mandate mass wearing among our children as the entire justification is based upon political science and supposition, not medical or true scientific evidence of any kind. In addition, how many of your parents have children with dental problems since masks were mandated? Okay, Bill, your defense is up. Thank you. This is Dennis McCurney. Uh, Dennis McCurney, uh, Mineral Point. I'm a Mineral Point graduate back in 1964. And I've seen a lot of things go on in Mineral Point, but I have never seen science and political beliefs divide a community like it's done. It's totally ridiculous what's going on here. You have all kinds of evidence, all kinds of medical advice. You have all kinds of examples to look at. If you want to look at what's going on with the COVID virus, in particular the Delta version, look to the South. Look to the states in the South. That's all you have to do. Thank you. Thank you. This is Will Harris. Good evening, everybody. I'm Will Harris. I've got a son that will be enrolling in kindergarten this year. Exciting. Um, but first, I just want to actually have everybody will participate, hopefully, have a round of applause for the school board. For what they've gone through in the last year, and all the things they've Even though they might not uh, believe it, I've learned a lot from each of you watching these meetings about uh, how to represent the community, how to represent different beliefs. And uh, it's, you know, it's been a really tough situation. Tonight's another <laughs> tough situation, tough decision. And I'm sure in the coming months, there's going to be more. Um, it's really great to see everybody, too. Whether you got a mask on or not, it's nice to be in a public place, to see everybody. Um, and I agree with what Bobby said about uh, people talking to each other and respecting each other's opinions. I'm sure it's not like that in other communities. But at Mineral Point, it is. And that's why. I chose to live here. nothing in that here. You know, some of the people I listened to tonight, well, lastly, sorry, I wanted to have my grandpa's primary hair, so he was primary law. Primarily had a joke for every situation. No parents. And I thought of, according to Dr. Gunn's crown rules, I couldn't tell. So here we are. We got one more. <laughs> I listened to Christina, there's a buddy of mine, um, and some other people talking about their kids. And I haven't seen concerns um, you know, for my son. What I'm pretty hard about facial expressions, the emotional side of everything. But I really think the most important thing is to get these kids on school. Um, last year we did virtual pre K. It actually went really well. And kudos to the to Mrs. Burris and, and the school district for doing that. It all worked out just fine. Um, Henry's where he needs to be. And and uh, you know when I when I listen to Christina, I, I didn't catch the other person's name, but I, I've got the same concerns. I'm on one side, clearly, but both masking, and, and they're on the other side, and you know that's okay. I just think that the quickest way to get to in-person school for everybody without masks is by wearing masks. Even if it's just for a couple weeks, a month, two months, let's just start out there. It's kind of where we left off last spring. I hear everybody's concerned, and I hope we can just get through this. And then with the masks off, you know, it broke my heart to see the, the girls team wearing masks in the state tournament last year. I don't know how well they did that, but 
Like I'm out of breath just standing here talking with one eye, but all pumped up. Uh, so, you know, I just hope that uh, we can wear masks and get into this. Um, well, your time's up. Well, all right. Okay, thanks, buddy. <laughs> This is Emma Steppes. Um, I'm Emma Steppes. I'll be a senior this year at Hiram Point. Uh, I'm here on behalf of the volleyball team on behalf of the student body of my siblings, friends, um, myself personally. Uh, we, the volleyball team especially has gone all summer with not a single mask in sight. We've gone to so many leagues, so many camps. I've been to track camps, volleyball camps. We had a team camp the other, about three weeks ago or so. And you haven't heard of a single COVID case. We've done all the state, we've all been fine. Um, it seems like we've been in practice for like three weeks now. Without a single mask, we've all been safe, we've all been fine. Not a single COVID case as well. Um, I would say the same thing about school events, many 4-H events, FFA events. National Honor Society. Um, a lot of, some of these girls have been to the state fair, the county fair. There's been so many different things without a mask. And just if you're just going to put a mask back on, like one day you have a mask on, one day you have a mask back on, that's incredibly hard on our bodies, especially we just conditioned this morning, been conditioning all summer without a mask on. And it's going to take us about probably three weeks to get back to use to wearing a mask. And we are a much stronger volleyball team this year. And I think that's partly because we can breathe a lot better because we're performing to our ability. Um, I'm Jessica Hill. So obviously I'm in support of mask optional. You know, the parents, if their kid has the flu, if their kid falls off the monkey bars, some, if not most of them, aren't going to take them to medical professionals right away. So why should the medical professionals decide what the parents want for their kids for basically like 10 years of their life? Like it's their school year and the parents should decide at this young age if they are, and some of us are old enough, like all of us are old enough, high school is old enough, middle school is old enough. I'd say half the elementary school, if not all the elementary school, is old enough to decide if they want to wear a mask. And I want to close with a statement that if I'm old enough to decide if I want to use the boys' or girls' bathroom, I'm old enough to decide if I have to put a mask on my face. Or if I And then we'll have three that want to speak from the from the virtual online participation. I'm tired. I'm tired of pro mass anti vaxxers I'm sorry, I'm tired of pro vax pro maskers calling others selfish. I'm tired of anti maskers anti vaxxers calling others scared mindless followers. I'm tired of Facebook exchanges where adults behave like we did in junior high. I've gotten really good at unfriending and blocking people on both sides of this issue because I'm tired of the others. I'm tired of losing people in my life. And yes, I'm tired of wearing a mask in indoor public places. Maybe you were lucky as a kid and you didn't witness regular bickering between people convinced they were right. Maybe you didn't see people throw away relationships over pretty, really petty stuff. If you weren't so lucky, maybe one day you realize that focusing on being right makes it nearly impossible to get it right. Several years ago, I stopped at the pit stop to gas up on my way to work. While at the pump, a fellow pointer wanted to chat about an item on the school board agenda that night that impacted his family. That night happened to be my first night as a member of the Point School Board. That brief chat influenced my entire six years on the board. Why? 
because it made me remember that my input and decisions would impact real people that I very likely need to look in the eye sometime soon. These relationships, caring about each other, this commitment to civility, is what I think gives this place some of its magic. If you're here tonight, I believe you care about our kids, regardless of your opinions on COVID and masks. The one thing, perhaps the only thing I suspect all of us in this room agree on, is that we do not want to put our kids through virtual learning again this year. Some schools have already gone back in session. Some are requiring masks, some are not. A number of those not requiring masks are already finding it necessary to resort to virtual learning. If for no other reason than to increase the chances of our kids to physically stay in school with their classmates and teachers, it seems we would be wise to require masks for students and staff while indoors together. Let's ride this above the ugliness and name calling and assumptions and show our kids how to do our best to get this right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next uh, online is Alice Carey. Please unmute yourself and state your name. And I missed what you said to state other than my name. I'm Alex Carey. I have uh, three children actively in the district. And your residence, Alex? Sorry. sorry. Residence. I died in Mineral Point. Thank you. So I'd like to recognize that each of us are guided by the social world in which we reside. Our social media, our friends, our family, they fuel our beliefs and our values. Social media, Facebook, Google, they're all run by algorithms that feed us what we want to see. You'll find an article that serves your point just by the way you type the question and what you've searched before. And I'm not here to ask you to ignore everyone and everything that tells you you're right and I'm wrong. I'm not here to ask you to change your opinion on COVID. I'm here to ask you to recognize that my fears are real to me, that even if you don't believe what I believe, that that is okay and I respect that. We don't have to agree on everything to support each other. Masks optional is meant to show support for those of us who fear the disease, right? But those of us wearing masks have been told that yes, wearing a mask protects us a little bit, but the person with COVID wearing a mask too protects us a whole lot more. So sending our kid with masks to a room full of kids without from families who don't fear COVID as much and take greater risks does not feel safe and does not make me feel supported. I'm not advising you what to do outside of school, masks or no masks. If you choose to vaccinate or not, those aren't my decisions to make. I ask that you choose to support me and those like-minded by sending your kids to school in masks. I'm comfortable letting sports be mask optional because we can choose whether our kids participate. That is a choice. I stress the what if we're wrong approach. If we ask everyone to mask and later find out that we were wrong and that masks didn't work, what are we out? If we don't mask and find out we were wrong, we might suffer really grave consequences. If you can't wear a mask because of health problems, I respect that. I'd love to see those of you wear a sticker that says, I'm at risk wearing a mask, but thank you for protecting me by wearing one. You are the reason I wear a mask. Dental issues, that's new to me, and I'd like to look into that. Dirty masks, let's chat ways to offer kids free masks in school. I know I'd happily donate some. There are so many ways around these concerns and we can find alternative solutions together, supporting each other. The seven of you board members and the team that supports you, you've been given a weight that you shouldn't have to bear. Enemies you should not have to create. It doesn't have to ride on you. Why can't we be the community that sets the example and takes the decision off the shoulders of those of you willing to take the heat in those seats? Why can't we put the decisions in the hands of intelligent groups of people who do the research for a living, who know the history, know the risks, test the risks? Why can't we just decide if the CDC says it's safer to wear masks, we wear masks. If they say we don't have to, we don't have to. No more arguing, no more guessing, no more I'm right and you're wrong and wedges between friends. It just is what it is based on a team dedicated to the safety of all of us. Thank you. Next is Amanda Swenson. Hello, members of the board. I'm Annika Svensson. I'm your local friendly epidemiologist who many of you got to know over the last year. 
I was really hoping we could stop seeing each other like this. More than my education and expertise, I'm a mother to three remarkable kids who are fifth generation pointers. I'm a friend and relative to many in this community and county. I'm a daughter of an emergency room physician, a sister of a pediatrician, and an advocate and cancer researcher. I could speak to the data that I've shared with all of you via email, but sometimes big numbers, variance, and the nuance of science gets lost in translation. You've heard a number of incorrect statements from speakers tonight, and I don't fault them. They are not experts, and science evolves. When we know better, we do better. I'm coming here tonight to ask you to trust us, the healthcare for providers and the scientists and the public health professionals in our very own community, the ones who will care for you, for your family and your children should anything happen. We care about all of you, no matter your beliefs, your religion, your political views. The tenant of public health is about community. SARS-CoV-2 does not just impact one person. This is a family, a community disease. Even though we are so lucky that most children do survive, Often family members get sick too. One million children have been orphaned because of this disease. We can learn from the past. And having attended nearly every school board meeting last year, I remember each of your concerns around missing in-person school, sporting events, and the family and workforce impacts on quarantines. We all want some normalcy and routine. We want our kids back in school. You even have a legal responsibility to offer special education services to children who might be medically vulnerable. I'm not asking you to become a public health expert. I'm asking you to trust the experts. With you in the room, within our community, and at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the American Academy of Pediatrics, who've advocated for masking. Masks help decrease the spread. And I know what people say, we weren't born with that on our face. No, I wasn't born with a mask on my face, but I also wasn't born wearing glasses. And I even have some clothes on too. And yet here we are. I urge all of you to consider the impacts of quarantines on learning, sporting events, mental health. And I'd ask you, why wouldn't you want to help your community, your youngest pointers who aren't yet old enough to be vaccinated, the single parent working multiple jobs who can't miss more work, and the student athlete who wants to have a normal sports season with fewer health impacts. Please trust the scientists, the researchers, the CDC, the AAP, and the experts in the room and vote for mask use in our school districts. We will be here for you. Please be here for us. Thank you. Okay, the last speaker is Etienne White. Hello. Um, this is great to hear the community coming together. It's great to see the total numbers, more than 160 people here. No matter what our opinions are, it's great to see that everyone cares. I'm going to start with some words from my nine-year-old who is hoping to join Mineral Point School for the first time this year as a third grader. He's too shy to talk, but he wrote some speaking points down, and I'm going to read those. He thinks we should mask up to protect the town. He thinks we should mask up because there's less risk of sickness. You protect yourself and others. You prevent another mutation and you get to stop germs of COVID-19 spreading. He also said while there was discourse this evening because he's been listening to every word, he's been sat here right with me, um, that the emotional piece that children might lose from children wearing masks, he says that'll just make children smarter because we'll have to figure out new ways to decode what people are saying. So those are his points. I also, you can probably tell from my accent, I'm not a third generation pointer. I am actually from London, England, and my passport allows me to live in tons of different countries. And the country I choose to live in is the US. And the place in the US I choose to live in is Mineral Point. There really is no other place on the planet quite like this place. What I do want to say, though, is to address some of the comments that other people have had this evening about statistics from Europe. I have family in the UK and I have family in Sweden. I actually lost my uncle in Sweden during COVID. I had to attend his funeral at 3 a.m. U.S. time by Zoom. 
Um, so let's start with the UK, though. Currently, Delta in the UK is ravaging the UK and the hospitals are maxing out. 34.9% of people that are hospitalized right now with Delta in UK hospitals are double vaccinated. Um, so there is the breakthrough. And someone said earlier that the Delta is not resulting in people being hospitalized in the UK. 34.9% of people that are in uh, with Delta are double vaccinated. Um, Sweden, someone talked about Sweden earlier, not masking. You're right, they did not mask and they did not lock down. And time.com, you can look it up. There's a, there's a headline there from earlier this year that says the Swedish COVID-19 response is a disaster. And the politicians there have been told they have blood on their hands because of the death rates and fatalities that they had in Sweden. I will add though, that Sweden is a country very unlike this country in its culture. It has a culture of social responsibility to one another. The way that represents in day-to-day -day living is they have free medical, they have free college, they have free on-the-job training. Uh, so I can only imagine if we had been, given how individualistic we are as a country here, if we had not had the mask mandates and the various lockdowns that we had, what our fatality rates would have looked like. I'm going fast because I have so much I want to say. I'm sure I'm going to get cut off at some point. Um, children wearing masks. They are not just protecting children. They are protecting our elderly. And also, no one's mentioned it yet, but there are others who are yeah. immunocompromised in our community. Am I at time? Time. All right. Um, I just can I just say one last thing, which is Mineral Point is a magical place. Part of the reason it's magical is because of the community spirit we have. If we can make a choice, not as individuals, but a choice for a community to mask up, I think that the magical place can continue. Thank you. Okay, that ends the public comment period. I just want to say thank you for being here, thank you for participating, thank you for treating everyone with respect and being good listeners. And uh, I'm just very proud to be sitting here um, um, leading this meeting. So thank you, uh, thank you very much. And thank you for being patient with me reviewing the policy rules and all that. I'm kind of a rookie um, when it comes to being board president. So I appreciate your patience. Okay, next. We will go to items for information and discussion. Do we want to address anything at this time? We'll go into action items and talk about everything then. Okay. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Wainwright and have him introduce uh, what we're going to talk about uh, next. And anyone else is going to present any data or information. You have in your you have in your board packet uh, the mask and face covering policy that was repealed back in the spring of the year. Uh, it was suggested that we bring that back to the board agenda. Um, we also have an action item about adopting the WIAA fall sports guidelines. Um, there are certain discussions that we have been involved in. Uh, the admin team has met with our medical advisor, our school nurse. We talked about what is our number one priority. Uh, it has been mentioned multiple times here tonight. And I would say the administration strongly, strongly supports keeping students in the buildings five days a week, all year long. Uh, when we looked at the, the CDC guidelines when it came to masking and quarantining and uh, the social distancing, and, and we believe in a layered approach with the, with the hand washing, the disinfecting, the cleaning. Um, the administrative team would certainly, at this point in time, recommend while indoors during the school day, students uh, wear a mask. Because of uh, the guidelines that come from the CDC, it, it allows people, in essence, to quarantine within the building, within the classroom, uh, as long as they're symptom free and can be tested. Um, so that, that would be the recommendation coming out of the administrative team at this time. Okay, so we have the board policy 443.11, which is mask and face coverings. Um, uh, we're going to get to the point where uh, we're going to have a vote on that policy. Um, before we do that, I want to have a presentation from 
our medical advisor and school nurse about what the current state of the pandemic is in our community and introduce uh, the proposed protocols um, as um, the proposed protocols will differ depending on whether we have universal masking. So uh, we'll talk through what these protocols mean um, with or without universal masking, and then we'll take a vote on the uh, board policy. Okay, thank you. Thanks for everybody's comments and spirited discussion tonight. And um, as again a reminder, our I think our shared goal is to try to keep the kids in person as much as possible this year, and also to help prevent as much as possible the spread of COVID nineteen within our schools. So we took under advisement the CDC recommendations, the State Department of Health recommendations. Department of Public Instruction and Iowa County Health Department recommendations and created this instructional model with input from our admin team to try to find a way that we can find a balance between keeping kids in person as much as possible and making sure that we're keeping people safe as much as possible. So uh, one of the main differences compared to last year when it comes to the situation we're in right now is, you know, we had a nice six week period over the summer where we had very few cases and we were able to be, you know, un unvaccinated people. CDC said you can go unmasked in public buildings and things like that. And then, very unfortunately, the Delta variant, which um, started during a very difficult surge in India and then transmitted throughout the entire world, became the dominant strain in our area and in the rest of the country. And the difference between the Delta variant and the um, variant that we saw most of the year last year is the increased transmissibility. So data will play out over time to see if it's more severe or not. That's really, we're, we don't have that data yet to see whether it's more severe, but it's definitely more transmissible. And so if you have a transmission rate that's four times higher than the rate that we had last year for, for COVID, you may say you have four times as many cases, even if by percentage, it's just the same amount of severity, you're gonna have four, much, four times as much severe disease. So the goal of any policy that we would have within the school would be to cut down on transmission from person to person so that we're not contributing to community spread within the school. Last year, with our precautions, we did quite a good job at, at preventing school being the source of a community outbreak, but that was with all those protections in place. So we removed all those protections, and it's and a more transmissible variant. There are modeling data that support that if you have an unmasked, unvaccinated population, for example, the elementary school, after two months of un of uh, in-person school unmasked, you will have a 90% rate of spread. So that would be something I'd like to try to prevent as a community is unmitigated spread within um, classrooms and within our school buildings. So, uh, you know, the last time we met, we still were in that low transmission rate in our, in our community, but we're seeing some of those other areas in the, in the country, unfortunately seeing big surges in their cases. And we didn't really know whether that, when that was going to get or whether that would hit our area. Um, in late July, we started to see an increase in cases and we rose through the ranks of the CDC um, risk, risk uh, categories. We were in the low risk then we went to moderate, very quickly rushed through substantial and now we're in the high risk category and have been there for about three weeks. That high risk category correlates to a CDC and um, State Department of Health recommendation that all people wear masks inside any public spaces. So regardless of what the CDC recommendations are for K-12, right now the recommendation is that every person in our community be wearing a mask when they're in public places. And that's not to be punitive, and it's not to... Um, you know, try to take it out on people or make people feel bad about where we're at, it's to try to reduce the spread of the disease. 
So in addition to those recommendations for the general community, the CDC has also made a recommendation based on the Delta variant that all K through 12 schools have universal masking policy in place. That CDC recommendation is endorsed by our State Department of Health, it's endorsed by our county health department, and it's endorsed by our admin team, and uh, myself as medical advisor and our school nurse team. Go ahead, Dr. Fox, can you uh, explain why why masking for COVID as a outbreak and not for flu? So flu is less transmissible than COVID. Um, so we the R not value that we've seen for for influenza for children um, it's not quite what somebody put it before. Um, it's 1.5 to 1.8. So that R naught means on average one person with influenza will infect 1.5 to 1.8 people. Um, it, we also have a vaccine for influenza that's available to all children. And so we have some reduction in that risk just based on that vaccine being available as well. Um, COVID last year had an R naught value of two. So that meant on average, each person was infecting two other people. So it's slightly higher than flu to begin with. And now the Delta variant is at six to eight cases per person. So one person with COVID on average will infect to six to eight people. That's more infectious than varicella, which is chicken pox. So if you had a chicken pox epidemic in your community and you would think about maybe shutting down a classroom for that, this is more infectious than that. And so the, the masks cut down on, on that transmission just by blocking those viral particles. The other difference with influenza is that with influenza, when people are infectious, they are sick. So you get a fever, you know to stay home, you're staying home during that time when you might be shedding viral particles. COVID, unfortunately, the way that it sets up in the body is you start shedding viral particles up to 48 hours before you would have any symptoms at all. So asymptomatic people infect people without even knowing that they have it. So that's why the universal masking is important and not just, just mask when you're sick or something like that. Can you speak to the concern about hypercapnia and masking? So the study that was um, released briefly in the American Academy of Pediatrics Journal on um, hypercapnia, which is the buildup of carbon dioxide in, in the blood, who are wearing masks that was very quickly debunked. And there is not a concern by the American Academy of Pediatrics for hypercarbia or hypercapnia in, um, in people wearing masks. We in healthcare have worn them for many, many years and we've done many studies on our carbon dioxide levels. There may be, when we're first wearing masks, a slight increase, and then our body regulates that over the course of about a week. So Many people noticed last year when they started the school year that they maybe felt a little bit uh, the first week it's hard to get used to wearing the mask. Um, and uh, that, that is your body kind of adjusting to that slight increase in uh, carbon dioxide that's not harmful. And if it were harmful, we'd be seeing a lot of problems with that uh, in people who are in the medical uh, profession. Children are not any more vulnerable to hypercapnia than adults would be. And masks are not considered to be harmful by the American Academy of Pediatrics, um, CDC, and American Academy of Family Physicians. Are you able to address uh, any data that compares effectiveness of preventing COVID with a combination of D3, zinc, ivermectin uh, versus uh, vaccination? Uh, so there, there's no contest between vaccination and any of those um, treatments. There's been no outpatient treatment that's been proven to be effective other than monoclonal antibody treatment, which is an infusion that we can give after somebody has already been exposed or tested positive. Ivermectin has been studied. There has not been any data to support that it's effective in preventing severe disease, and there are some serious concerns with toxicity. So the FDA, CDC, Infectious disease groups are not recommending ivermectin, they're not recommending hydroxychloroquine, there's no data for hydroxychloroquine. Vitamin D, there was some promise for it initially, it didn't play out, but it's pretty harmless. So vitamin D supplementation for kids is not 
something that could potentially be harmful. So that certainly, if people want to do that, that's a, that can be a good idea. Zinc, um, there might be some potential benefit very early in the, in the course, but there's some toxicity with that as well. Some people get significant nausea and vomiting with them. Yeah, here. The public comment period is over, so we will not have any back and forth during the public comment period. But now we're having a discussion of the data and clarification of the data from our medical staff that's been hired by the district. And so I'm trying to relay some of the public comment concerns uh, that they want to have addressed at this time um, as a context leading into pros and cons of masking and face covering. Is that fair? And the board, any board member can ask Dr. Fox any, any questions. I was just, uh, I had taken some notes about public comments and I want to get those clarified before we dig any further. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead and uh, talk into the mic. So, Sarah and Gene, a year ago, you were sitting here at the Health Board at the meeting by Tyler to. What? Go ahead, Larry. To. Keep our kids in school, and I believe we were told that uh, we would be a, a model school. Oh, I, so I don't know if you're well aware, but plus 27 kids last year, it's been said many, many times, only by here and I don't get to class to other schools. Uh, I said some of the parents are here, and, and I feel for you guys. You want your kids in school. Get, get back to that. See, you said trust us. Um, and the unit said trust your doctors, trust your epidemiologist, trust the school nurse. So the first quarter went by, we'll change. Second quarter went by, that we would see less. Uh, the third quarter, a lot of discussion, a lot of arguing. We finally got the kids back in four days, but we still need Wednesdays to. Handle the virtual, yes. Well, more information came in on that. And the board wasn't being told all the facts and the truth. So we had a, a mother, a parent came in and explained to the board, you guys know what you're doing. And she single handedly got our kids. Back in school, finally, the fourth quarter of last year, five days a week. So three months later, you're right back in the same spot saying, trust us, we're the medical experts. I'm not quite buying what you're selling. You know, I, I will go back to where we were at in August of 2020, where we had no school had had any in-person time with COVID. So we were, we were flying blind and creating a plan that we were trying to make sure we were implementing the, the precautions that we were given at the time. And with the admin team came up with the plan so that we would very we would be able to have some virtual experience so that when we eventually went virtual, it wasn't a brand new technology for people. We had worked out some of the technology uh, issues, as well as having decreased time where people could potentially expose other people at school. And that part of it worked. If you remember last year, we started a week before anyone else, at least a week, right? And we, uh, we rerolled that surge in terms of the numbers of cases we had in our schools, and we're writing that at a lower level than what other surrounding districts were, even though we had had an extra week of school and potential exposure. We happened to be in the worst surge of the year in November of 2020, like all of Wisconsin, 
And so timing of that probably coincided to a huge surge in cases in colleges and schools starting in September, which then filtered out to the rest of the state. So if we can try to be as a community cautious about how we, how we mitigate risk here, we might be able to prevent some spread within our community by mitigating this risk. And if you'll notice in the plan that we've laid out, and I can go into some detail, the, the way that we are trying to get through this year is by trying to maximize the amount of in-person time by minimizing the numbers of close context exclusions that we had. So much of the year when people were missing school and we had massive numbers of teachers out in October where we couldn't find subs to cover for them, um, or massive numbers of students out where we said, this whole classroom is going to have to be virtual because we don't have enough kids in class to make this perfect. This plan should mitigate some of that risk of, of exclusions by adding a different layer of protection, which is that testing layer that we didn't have available to us last year. I have another comment, uh, Mr. President. Uh, but now, I identify myself as our local epidemiologist. She sent this email uh, back to me last week, and I'd like to reference in that email uh, to, to the attorney somewhere. In that email, to the board, he's working on this. So you're rereading, you're rereading a quote from the email we got from her. Yes, okay. our local member. Right. To the extent anti maskers object that masks violate their right to liberty, parenthesis, my body, my choice, parenthesis, they need merely read the Supreme Court's Jacobson versus Massachusetts decision. It explains why mask mandates don't violate any constitutional right to privacy health or bodily integrity. That bothered, that bothered me all week because I remember that case from way back in high school. And I'm wondering if Shana or Bren can shed light on that case. What was that case called? Well, we're going to have, we can have Shana talk about the, specifically the violation of liberty with masks, the uh, Davidson versus Massachusetts. I'm talking about Jacobson versus Massachusetts. I can't help you. Brett, can you enlighten us? You would, you would yeah, we'll have to get approval from the board to have a citizen you know, who's not been invited to the discussion to actively participate in the discussion. Uh, hey, Dr. Fox, can, you presented the protocol for the school year. Oh, did, did you make a motion? Okay. Okay, do I have a second? Okay, Mr. Skelding? Okay. Uh, so, you want to set any allotted time? No, just two minutes. Okay. Angie, uh, we have a motion uh, to ask the, uh, the guest speaker to give an opinion on a specific matter for two minutes and take a roll call. No. No. Yes. No. So passes four to three, correct? Okay. Go ahead, sir. You have two minutes. All right, I'll start off by saying that this is a legal advice is on all of my clients. Uh, but Jacobson versus Massachusetts is a case I've gone up against quite a few times in various federal and state cases I've brought against public health public health agencies in Wisconsin to include Bay County Public Health and various school districts throughout Wisconsin. One thing about it is it was decided in 
five before any levels of strict scrutiny uh, have been determined by the federal Supreme Court. The local cases as a place of vaccines and mass mandates that have reached a Supreme Court, it hasn't even been cited as a footnote other than it exists. We can talk about Jacobson, but one of the key quotes in there is actually not from Jacobson, but it's from a case that cited Jacobson as authority. That is what Chris Bell was one of worst decisions, which have been called out as one of the worst decisions. That basically said that local governments have the ability, and this again, what versus Bell, to forcibly sterilize individuals that may be unfit for society. Uh, and the quote in there goes something along the lines of three generations of imbeciles are enough. Now, that is still technically good law. It has not been overturned. But the Supreme Court, the federal courts, have not even considered Jacobson in their decisions. The state Supreme Court has not been even considered Jacobson. So, yes, that case exists. And I like to compare it to uh, any of the other civil rights cases that would still be technically uh, good law. Dred Scott saying that African Americans are not people or citizens has never been overturned in the federal Supreme Court. It was overturned by an act of Congress. Uh, so again, I would I just cause hesitation or suggest hesitation when we address cases from over 116 years ago uh, based on how the court does that. Right. Right. Thank you, sir. Right. Okay. Thank you. All right. Yes. Uh, there should be a mic on it. Oh, sir. Yeah. Well, Dr. Fox, is there studies that look at kids in school with no mitigation strategies and only masks? Uh, yeah, there was a. So there's a collection of studies that are observational from last year. So we have to take it with a little bit of a grain of salt because this is pre-Delta. We don't have any Delta information. Um, they looked at distancing alone, vaccination alone. They, and these are modeling studies now. So, you know, it's all hypothetical based on modeling, based on the R0 the value. And so there is some reduction with distancing, ventilation. All of the mitigation efforts that we've worked on in the last year have some impact, but by far and away, the most impactful is masks. Because when I look at when the CDC updated their guidance in July, and when I look at their website, it talks about work to work. The evidence to date suggests that staff to student and student to student transmission are not the primary means of exposure to science COVID 2 among infected children. Several studies have concluded that students are not the primary sources of exposure to SARS CoV 2 among adults in school settings. And then I didn't have time to go through all the citations of the scholarly journals, but I picked a couple at random. And there was one in St. Louis, some in Utah, one in Wisconsin. And in the abstract, it always talks about that it might reduce. So I see one side where it should come down to the family to make that decision. But at the end of the day, too, just because something might change it, and based on that, none of us should eat junk food, none of us should drink alcohol. That's where I get concerned. Because on the other hand, like your personal health worker has talked about that in CDC. I mean, I would think that the best thing anybody can do in this room is to live a healthy lifestyle to improve your immune system. But it never gets talked about. It's just something that might produce not statistically significant. So then the numbers of people that get COVID, the vast majority of people of children in the last year who got COVID with all those mitigation efforts in place were from household contacts. So what that tells to me is that household risk, household exposure, very, very high risk, you're spending a lot of time together with people unmasked. And if you are in the household with somebody who has COVID, you have a very high risk of getting COVID yourself. Compare that to send a child to school and all these mitigation efforts are in place, and you're presumably not spending large numbers of time with you know, people on masks except for you know, social and outside of school. That means that the school can effectively 
prevent transmission from student to student so that my child is protected at school just the same as they would be protected outside of school. So the, the masking policy that protects the elementary school child, the mask option was one of the parents pointed out, if you opt to not mask your child and I opt to, you're not giving me a choice because you're not giving me that choice to protect my own child because it's that person's mask that protects my child, not their own mask. It's source control as the number one way of preventing transmission. And you can certainly find studies that will, you know, find, we are going to know a lot more in 10 years, but boy, it's not 10 years from now. We have to make a not know. So the CDC also talked about the website that says, therefore, the 21 to 22 school year will not be directly comparable to the 20 to 21 school year. But also, do it's based on the data, but it just says the evidence to date does not suggest that it's staff the student or student, student that's driving the transmission. Because of the mitigation measures that were in place last year across the country. So various yeah. school district. All these school districts that are studied, you have to, if you want to make a policy that has the same level of spread as last year in with a more transmissible virus, you have to at least have the level of protection we had last year. And that's universal masking is what we had. Plus the others. Plus all the other mitigation efforts, like universal masking is the by far and away most effective way to prevent, prevent spread is in a classroom. I guess I just don't see the ones that talk about where it's only mass. I don't know that any, I mean, there, there certainly are schools that packed kids in 30 to a classroom with masks on last year, but I don't think they were in person until May. Those are urban school districts where they didn't have any other choice for distancing. So in, in rural school districts, most of the studies are based on rural school districts like ours, where they have the ability to space somewhat you might have somewhat outdated ventilation systems, but they, you know, that's something to work on. Hand hygiene and masking and, and staying home when sick and doing screening and exclusion appropriately. We can't say what percentage does each one provide. And I don't know what, whether we would ever have that data, but maybe 10 years from now. But then how can we say, or how can we say that the mask is by far the universal best? Because in places like healthcare settings where people are wearing masks and not able to distance, we're seeing decreased spread. So we're, and then, you know, the other thing to think about is if, if masks didn't work, it doesn't make sense that we had such few diseases in children this last year. So masks help to prevent all sorts of viruses from passing. And so we saw the lightest year we've seen ever ever for children, probably because of masks. But hygiene, personal hygiene, social distancing, testing, all that stuff was in place. So I'll let others ask questions, but that's where... I don't think anybody would have an answer for you on what percent, you know, how can you separate out masks versus all the other mitigation efforts. But when we look in large-scale studies of how things are transmitted, mask-free, mask Exposure is the highest risk for exposure, similar to that household exposure or social exposure. Good question. Sorry. Yeah. Dr. Fox, can you review the, the protocols as presented to the board and how the protocol differs with universal masking versus? Uh, with masking optional. You want me to talk through the whole thing or just the masking and exposures and quarantines? I mean, I think you can hit the high points as far as listing the other safety measures um, without going into great detail. But then, and, and yes, um, you can go on to page two with the, uh, the quarantine and close contact comparison chart. And it, admin, if you have anything to add on this, just um, interrupt if there's anything I'm saying that's incorrect regarding classrooms, that sort of thing. Um, so the, the 
instructional model for the district is to offer in-person instruction for the 21-22 school year. Um, there is a caveat that if there is a um, threshold that cases meet within the district, so such that more than 30% of the student body is absent, there may be a consideration for going to a virtual school year similar to a flu season. So there's a previous um, document from Department of Public Instruction regarding flipping to uh, you know, closing down a building if you have more than 30% of your kids being absent for influenza. And I would suggest a similar threshold. Um, in terms of safety measures, the recommendation for face coverings is that students and staff in grades early childhood or pre-K through 12 will be required to wear masks indoors in all school buildings and while indoors at any school or district required events or activities. General public age five and up will be required to wear masks inside a district building. Based on a CDC and federal order, all students and staff are required to wear masks on school buses and when in school district owned vehicles, unless there's only a driver present. In other words, no students present. Students may remove face coverings when eating, drinking, during socially distanced step scheduled breaks, and at outdoor recess or classes, of course. Students and staff may be exempted from wearing face coverings due to special behavioral or individual needs. Exceptions made on a case by case basis by principal, director of special education, or district administrator. Um, Next, recommendations for hand washing, encourage frequent hand washing, use of hand sanitizer, do not touch face in the brain, and cover cough and sneeze. Social distancing, school district will encourage, to make, encourage students to maintain at least three feet of physical distance between other students within the school building. And school district will encourage teachers and staff to maintain at least six feet of physical distance between themselves and, student and students and other staff within the school building. And then the, this is the big part that's different from last year. So the recommendation for close contact and exclusion from school for exposure while at school has changed from the CDC from six feet to three feet if both people are masked. So if both people are masked and it's been, if they're at least three feet apart, that nobody is a close contact. If you have a classroom full of desks that are four feet apart and somebody comes to class and everybody's masked, there are no close contacts in that classroom. That's a big difference from last year and that's going to cut down on the number of people that would be excluded as a close contact. Um, the, if, if either one is unmasked, either the person with COVID or the person who was, with, who was um, in the classroom with them, if they're between three and six feet apart, and there was one person not wearing a mask, that person is considered a close contact. So that, that is a big change from last year that we've been able to tighten down the distancing because of the efficacy of masks that we've seen. Um, this applies only to student to student transmission. So um, there's a different math that comes into play when it's a teacher to student or a student to teacher. And so there's a six foot rule still in place regardless of not being in the situation. Dr. Fox, can you explain why they're with us? Yes, so um, last year when they had that six foot between students and teachers, or, so um, the, the concern is that um, among peers, there may be a lower risk of transmission from person to person. And also that the, um, the amount of direct face-to-face -face may be a little different compared to a teacher talking at a classroom versus two students sitting near each other. Um, the, the other concern is really the, the risk of exposure to people. Now, this is going to be somewhat new in some cases because we have such a high vaccination rate for teachers that they um, may still be counted as close contacts, but they would not have to quarantine based on our, our uh, the way we've laid out these close contact conditions. This is also does not apply to exposures outside of the classroom, partially because we don't have, um, 
you know, can we reliably say that somebody can rely on their self-report for whether they were masked? Um, and then also the household contact is such higher risk that that is considered a different situation compared to these in-school exposures. Okay, so um, going down to the, the chart there, um, that first box above says universally masked and at least three feet apart, not a close contact and no quarantine. Either person not masked and at least six feet apart is not a close contact and no quarantine. So what we're, what we're recommending is if we have universal masking, we have the ability to bring kids back to school while they're on their quarantine, if we add an extra layer of protection. So that extra layer of protection in uh, our school would be offering daily antigen testing at school for those, um, for the unvaccinated kids who are considered close contacts. And they can still come to school during that 14 day period, but they have to have a mask on. So if universal masking, it makes it easy to have those modified quarantines um, if there's not universal masking, somebody has to police. This person has to wear a mask till next Tuesday. Oh, that person doesn't have to wear a mask because of whatever. So this really allows us to bring, if we have universal masking, it allows us to keep kids in school, not only because we're reducing the number of people that are close contacts, but also because we are able to bring them back to that modified quarantine. When you speak about doing the testing in school, um, not doing the testing or anything, you're using the PCR test, is that correct? Um, so the Department of Health Services hooked up any school who is interested with a vendor for free testing. So it includes the antigen testing and the PCR testing. Okay. Now, is that the same PCR that the FDA said had many, many false results? Okay. There are several different platforms for PCR. Um, right now, we're currently using the Cepheid platform and the Abbott um, ID Now platform. Excuse me. Um, we, are all, our, we also are, if our numbers rise to this level, potentially sending out to exact sciences again, which we haven't needed because we haven't had enough tests that have needed to go out. Um, so it's run in conjunction with St. Mary's lab and our lab. False positive rates are very low, but there's some caveats to that, that if somebody um, had an infection two weeks ago and they get tested today, they could potentially still turn a PCR positive, but they're not, they don't have an infectious virus. So the antigen test, the advantage of that is it really picks up infectious virus to date. And so that antigen test, what we recommend is that we do um, a daily antigen test because antigen tests in series are much more accurate than a single antigen test alone. You can have a lot more false negatives if you just have a single antigen test. So a daily antigen test, if that's negative, they can be at school because we know that the amount of virus that they're shedding, even if they have it, is so low to not be picked up on that test. And then on day seven, they would have a PCR test. The likelihood of having all negative antigen tests and then a positive PCR test in a false negative kind of situation is very, very low. And there certainly are some protocols for confirming tests if we think that maybe there was some reason to doubt the accuracy of that. I have no idea how the antigen test works, so could you explain to us or me? Yep. So the antigen test is similar to a rapid strep test or a pregnancy test, where it's got a tiny strip. Um, it's got a, a little um, swab that you uh, swab somebody's nostrils. And it's not a deep swab, it's just a superficial swab. We can even have kids, some kids do self swabs because it's um, just has to be a certain amount of time in the nostril. And then the um, swab goes into a part and a couple of drops of fluid are placed on the part and that um, develops over the course of 15 minutes. And the, um, the antigen, which is the protein on the outside of the COVID virus, attaches to a special marker that will turn red so you get a, instead of a one line, you get two lines, kind of like a pregnancy test or a rather a strep test. And so what, what we've seen in clinic typically is that the 
People who are positive turn positive pretty quickly, but we have to wait a full 15 minutes to see something's truly negative. So we we can have the PCR test, and that would still be nasal too. It's not going to be a deep swab. My question is on that stick. Does it say evil on the stick? See, excuse me, evil. Uh, I don't think we have any in house, um, but we can certainly make sure that the swabs are a validated kind that would meet your criteria. I would say. Good. That's all I have. Good question. Yeah, that's a good question. It all depends on what you all decide tonight. Um, but the company can come out and they can bring staff out here to test. If we have large groups that need to be test, tested. Our school is fairly small and, and hopefully we're not doing mass amounts daily. Um, but anybody can help it up can watch a video and swap themselves. So I would have the students, you know, say there was a group of 12. Um, swap themselves, put in the car, wait in the designated area, and then, you know, if it's negative, they go to class. Um, the younger students is where it would get to be a logistics thing, and they do it all, and how much time is it going to take. Um, so this company can come train staff to, to be designated um, test administrators, myself, um, or they can come on site. I worry about the logistics of, and timing of them coming on site. Ideally, we'd like to do this first thing in the morning so that kids can get right into the classroom. Um, so that's all to be determined by what you all decide to make. So as, um, as, as it is laid out in this recommendation is that testing is not required. Um, no child will be required to be tested. Yes. Yes. If they're a close contact, if they're defined as that person that was within that range. So if we cut down on the number of kids in that situation to begin with, that's going to help, right? Keep more people in. And then once we uh, once we are doing testing, that's of course with parent consent. So if a parent doesn't consent to any testing, then so this is, let me tell you that this is not what our our local health department wants people excluded for 14 days. The State Department of Health wants people excluded for 14 days. And the CDC wants people excluded for 14 days. CDC does have a caveat in their recommendation though that says if testing is available, that may be used at a local level to help to mitigate risk. So this is a risk mitigation, it's not a punishment. It's saying these kids are at risk for having COVID and could potentially spread it to other people. There's also the caveat that people who have COVID in the last 90 days are in or will be treated as if they are vaccinated for those 90 days because we know that they have some level of protection. This plan, the skip, seems very complicated. And I don't afford to see some information on the private uh, administrator recommendations. Now, I don't think anybody out there knows what, what you're not. For the most do, you, do you have specific questions that I can address? One, one reason this document is more so, first of all, this is very complicated. This is unfortunately a very, very complicated thing, and it's hard to simplify it. Um, so that it's you know easy to kind of have on hand information for who needs to do what. Just a simple question, um, Sarah. Do you, do you think the 27 kids that left our district are going to come back if they have to abide by these rules? I'm not just I'm, I'm not an administrator, I don't think I can answer that question. I do question whether there are people that would leave the district if there were not universal masking this year and no virtual option. Well, a year ago, there was no mention of kids being in the district, even though Gary and I, we, we talked about it regularly. Um, nobody seemed to care. But now all of a sudden, we care. Uh, you, you asked the question whether those people would. But, but you just told me that that's good. Uh, right. I said there may be other kids that could potentially be in the district as well. But again, that's an admin question. That's not it's a question for me. I would just like to clarify I have had several parents contact me that we don't have a math mandate. 
So if we have a vaccinated person, that's that extra layer of risk mitigation that we're using instead of the daily antigen test, but we still want those people to get tested on day three to five. And um, we need them to mask while they're at school. Um, there's a, a question of whether, so we, Jane and I don't have all the answers and we have some, uh, some pieces that we think are places where you could have some wiggle room. And so one thing we're questioning is whether vaccinated folks with a negative PCR and potentially unvaccinated people with a negative PCR could return to sports if they're masking. Now, the problem is that outdoor sports are, well, none of the sports right now are required masking. Um, so then it would be up to coaches or administrators to enforce masking for that person so that they could come back during that period after they've had that negative test. So if that's, um, I don't know if that's something that the board wants to talk about or Evan wants to talk about. The other question, um, and Emma brought it up with the volleyball earlier, is, you know, volleyball is considered just a medium risk sport indoors, but you're not interacting with another team. So the risk to the other team is relatively low. So it's really just the risk within the team. So, you know, even though we might have an indoor mask mandate, I could see some very logical reasoning for saying we're not going to require masks while those kids are playing or exercising or when they're on the bench or, you know, when they're gathering before or after games or things like that, then a mask will be required in those situations. I think that is a totally reasonable um, concession that I think would have low risk to community and to other teams. Can you talk about um, possible parameters for adjusting these protocols? I mean, obviously, our community is in the highest rate of transmission right now, but they consider the red zone. Um, based on the rise of the Delta variant cases in the community currently. Um, and a lot of other districts are adopting similar parameters that if the risk seems to be low in the community, should be less in some of these uh, precautions. Um, can you speak to that briefly in the, in the proposed protocol? Yes, what's proposed on the back page is um, that we when we get to low risk again, which was what, where we were at in June and early July, that um, NAS could be optional that way for seventh to twelfth grade, with the consideration that um, that is a more that's, that group of people has had the vaccine available to them. Um, we talked about whether parents would have the choice of you know wanting to potentially give their kids more protection from. COVID or not, and vaccine is one way that parents can choose to do that. So that seventh to twelfth grade group has had that access and has had that choice. So once we get down to low risk, if we get rid of masking, then I think the risk is really to the, the unmasked, unvaccinated folks. And the community risk is much lower because we're not going to see as many cases, but we still could see some outbreaks in the sport. The problem with once we make masks optional is that it becomes nearly impossible to do in school quarantine. Um, we'd be dealing with all lower numbers at that point, so we'd really need, you know, one or two kids at a time, potentially for quarantine rather than 20, which you could easily have at an unusual time. But at that point, I think unless masks are required or we find some way for admin to enforce masking for those close contacts, I think the quarantine would have to get home at that point. Um, my proposal here was that we have um, a clerical requirement for mass for um, four K through sixth grade until if we're in the low range until six weeks after a vaccine is available to the age group. Um, and you know, I think that's those numbers are somewhat 
somewhat debatable, but I think there's um, you know some question of what what good are we going to do to do six weeks of it, and then six weeks before a vaccine is available, all of a sudden we're unmasking everybody, and the, the parents that have that concern about masking to begin the year, whether they would um, have any reassurance with those lower numbers when there's not a vaccine available. So I again, Dana and I came up with this is modeled on the CDC numbers. So the CDC um, case rates for the county and the percent positive rate for the county. And so these are numbers that are um, slightly retrospective. So it's a week's worth of data. Um, and then it's reported a week at a time. So you don't have a running total, but you get kind of a weekly snapshot. And so based on that weekly snapshot, if you went two weeks in the low category, you mass would be optional for those higher age groups and you have um, real, relatively low risk of spread for the community. The caveat to that is if we go high again, then people have to be willing to re-implement the same precautions that we're doing when we have high cases now. So it has to be able to flex with what we're seeing in the communities so that we're not running the risk of outbreaks. So if you take the um, the breakouts of low, moderate, substantial, and high, can you tell us how many weeks over the last year we would have spent each of these buckets? Um, low, uh, I'd have to look back to see whether last summer we were low. We started the school year probably moderate last year. So different from now where we're starting high, but we started moderate. And then um, it really wasn't until the very end of the school year that we became low. So you can make an argument for potentially using moderate. The problem is that the moderate range is relatively large. So it's 10 to 49 cases per 100,000 for seven days. So that um, for our county ends up being about 12, 12 cases, three to 12 cases in, in the a week period. Okay, so we're our county about 25,000 people. Right? Yes, so multi uh, probably multiply by, um, multiply a case rate by four, or divide these rates by four. Um, and that's where you get the, the total number of cases. So the problem with being a small county, sorry to interrupt, is that um, one family could skew this. And so when we're going, so if we had a family of five that tested positive, that could potentially bump you up. But if you're overall low rate, then um, you should go back down. So my suggestion for reversing the mass policy would say we we are low and then cases are climbing again, um, would be you have to have two weeks at that higher level before you would say that we need to mask again. And is there data available at the school district level as opposed to the county level? And does that change um, does that change the frequency at which we would fall into the brackets? Uh, that's a good question. We can drill down um, as of recent months to that we don't have it retrospective for the last year, but we do. They can drill down cases to the code, and then we would have to, and so then, or, or school district, but then we would have to divide them by the total number of people in the school district, not by the counties. And we would still, you know, potentially look at a case rate like this as listed, but based on our school district rather than the county numbers. And that may make sense with some districts in our county not having mass requirements and things like that. We may see those numbers suddenly drive up and our numbers are fine. So a school dis district rate would be a reasonable thing to look at with that. Yeah, no uh, First of all, I want to say, even though it may not appear that way to everybody here, this, this document would be a Based on earlier the school, based on earlier exclusionary policies. But I appreciate the option to let us give the school, but they want to be in school and they ask the best. But I appreciate the option to eliminate some automatic exclusion, perhaps the bad things for the school, and they wouldn't be considered close contacts with the back school. I what is why is the PCR test necessary under seven days? Um, so, 
So the, the PCR test is still the gold standard test for COVID. And so um, there is potential for sampling errors with the antigen test, potential for user error with the card or with the drops or things like that. And the PCR has a much more reliable technology where we can pick up on the levels of disease that are meaningful to say yes to the COVID or no you don't. The COVID PCR is also the confirming test for any antigen positive. So antigen positive is when the symptoms and they're presumed to be positive. But sometimes we will um, both a PCR test them as well to confirm that. And so the antigen test alone will still miss a good number of kids, low risk to the people around them on those days. So it makes sense to still have a person if they have a negative. But that PCR test is the gold standard test and allows us to say, okay, the likelihood you have a negative PCR in day seven, there's quite a number of studies that have shown, okay, negative PCR in day seven. If you continue to mask, you're low risk for the people around you, even if you had a low level infection this week that wasn't picked up on all of our testing. But that PCR is still that gold standard to really say, okay, we're covered. The antigen test, those were negative all week, and this confirms that they did not have COVID. So, what is the outcome of the PCR on day seven? So, then they, so that person would be considered COVID positive. And then they would need to be excluded from school. But then we're going oh, out. What's that? Oh. So that is 10 days from the from either onset of symptoms if somebody's symptomatic or 10 days from a positive test. Okay. Yes. Yep. And so the, the onset of turning a test positive um, is anywhere between three and seven days, typically. After, especially after Delta, it's a little earlier in the course than what we were seeing with the wild type variant. So if we have negative antigens, that will be the likelihood we're going to have a positive PCR is very low, but not zero. And so we're not going to have a lot of people that fall into that case. That rate, I would say, the more likely scenario is that they're going to turn an antigen positive. We saw this with some staff this year, where they had household exposure. We were um, short-staffed and bringing people to, to work when they were close contacts even um, uh, during that 14 day period, but we were antigen testing them every day and they would antigen test positive and then the next day develop symptoms. And so we're catching them just slightly earlier. So more likely scenarios we see a positive antigen or be four reflex to PCR that PCR is positive and starting to be four starting their 10 days. <laughs> Yes, right. Yes, I would believe that that positive is also that point because this is with somebody that is we're not testing everybody, but we're testing somebody who has a pre test probability that's higher. So that positive PCR is less likely to be a false negative, and that positive predictive value of that test is that much higher. What happens to students who sat next to that student with masks, implement the person with masks on day one or seven? If they're, if they're not asked to say somebody is tested on day seven with the PCR and they're positive, if they were uh, not masked, then we'd be contact tracing all over the place. But luckily, we have a policy that they would be masked if everyone around them is masked and they're at least three feet apart, then there's no contact tracing. If they um, were in school for the two days before that positive test, and there are people within that, um, that three-foot distancing, if you have mass or six-foot distancing, if I'm masked, I'm going to be close contacts. And that would be a concern where we would start to say, hmm, we're maybe starting to see some spread in school. That's the other advantage to this, is we're able to pick up on spread in school earlier because we're having more um, rigorous testing, and so that may be something where we say something's not working with what we're doing. Something with our mitigation efforts is it ventilation in this classroom? Is there you know something else that we need to be doing, or is it just being forced to mask and things like that? And one more question, didn't see it on here, but that you just mentioned that we may require at home. 
14 different numbers. I don't see it on here. Um, I see the um, mask test and stay in school with the goal. Um, so we're saying we don't trust the administration to make sure those things are met. I'm not, I wouldn't say that just on a for the challenge of enforcement. Yeah, so it's just it's an enforcement challenge. Um, if you have mass optional, and you, maybe that's a case by case, maybe you have a classroom where everybody does mass. Say in the third grade, the teacher has, you know, even though, or let's not say third grade, let's say seventh grade, even though there's no masking requirement. There has been a concerted effort by this group of people to wear masks, and he's this student is one of those people that is very aware of loyal mask wearer, and you know you can say reliably that they're going to be distance and things like that. Then that could sort of be scenario where we bring them back. It's really just the, the ability to manage people in the building and say that we're protecting all the people around them. Doesn't someone do when? Oh, um, on that page. Um, on the back page under the low risk um, for quarantine, it says at home quarantine required. And again, those numbers would be the number of people that would be affected by that would be quite low um, because our numbers locally would be low. But um, again, that could potentially that could be some certainly a place where you could have some wiggle room where you as a board decided, um, you know, case by case basis with something like that. Or per admin approval or I don't know how the, the admin team would want to deal with those cases. And again, again, Andy, sorry to, um, to go back to this, but the vaccinated students and athletes, um, they're still required to mask for 14 days after each quarter. So they're counted as a close contact, required to mask, but they can do whatever they want. So they can be in sports, they can, you know, go out in the community and things like that um, with a mask on. So as long as we have that piece in place, then we're really opening up the ability for kids to be in school and um, in, in their activities at a much higher level. What is the estimated timeline for a vaccine to be available for, uh, for students under the age of six grade? Well? I'm, I'm hopeful that end of September, early October is going to be EUA approval. There's some um, rumblings that the, it may require a longer study period before they would do EUA for that age group. Um, What's EUA? Uh, sorry, that emergency use authorization, which the um, vaccine was under up until today when we got, yesterday when we got full approval for, um, the FDA got full approval for um, the Pfizer vaccine for ages 12 and up. The first vaccine that will likely be available to the 5 to 12 group will be Pfizer. And the Moderna is up there as well, so it's possible we have two choices. Um, uh, there is a potential that it's going to get pushed out. I think the latest it would be available to um, kids in our community would be in November. And I'm hoping that it's not going to be later than that because it's, you know, it really. By December, by September, they should have the data that they need to support that emergency use authorization. Member Janet. Thank you. I just want to say thank you, first of all, Dr. Fox, Nurse Linky, and the administration for taking the time to put this back together. Uh, I know it's a lot of work. Uh, and I just have a, a couple of points for you. I just want to make sure I'm understanding. So the, the Delta, uh, Delta variant is more contagious. What we have left. So things that we did last year may work, may not work quite as well. Did I might work. Yes, that's okay. Good. Uh, the next thing, uh, I do hear a lot of times people talking about size of a uh, molecule or a germ uh, being so small that you get right through the mass. So why are the masks effective? Um, so, so two pieces on that. One is the size of a viral particle um, that the, the infectious is larger than the size of the carbon dioxide molecule that people are worried is getting trapped in the mask. And so it's if the carbon dioxide were to get trapped in the viral particle, it's wrong. But the, the bigger 
uh, answer to that question, the real answer to that question is that viruses don't travel by themselves. They travel on respiratory droplets, and the respiratory droplets that transmit this are large enough that they are caught by the mass. There is some concern with aerosol spread of this illness, and that is something that um, there, there are some concerns with that, and I, I don't know that we have the data to say for sure that it's um, not a large part of spread. It is a part of spread, but I think the vast majority are from direct exposures to uh, somebody's respiratory droplets, which are suspended in the air when you're in close contact with somebody, and probably to a lesser degree, respiratory droplets that are going into the air and then filtering it through somebody that's really much more of a problem in a very confined space and without ventilation. So we, I, I think our ventilation system at this point in the schools is adequate that it's not likely it's going to spread by aerosol. Um, if it's spread by aerosol, then, you know, that's potentially through eye mucus membranes and other routes of spread, so the mask is um, less helpful in that case. So that would be something where we test some close contacts when we start to see, gosh, these people weren't even close contacts and they're symptomatic and we test them and they're positive and we see some spread within that cluster and that might be a signal that what we're doing perhaps is not meeting the level of what we need to do to protect those kids. Thank you, just one last question. I'm, I'm a little, a little concerned when we hear about um, maybe you know we look at some other school districts and they're waiting until they see what is going on in the buildings in the district itself because of the way COVID spread is it possible that it's just too late yeah once you detect a case in the school i mean by definition if somebody has been in school and they test positive there's already been a couple days of spread and likely much more spread than we're even aware of and so waiting till we see those positives within a building as the trigger for now we need to mask is, um, you know, the horse is already out of the barn on that one. Thank you. Yes, yes, yes thank you. Okay. So, Sarah, uh, there's been a lot of discussion on uh, masking, particle size, drop in size. You seem to counter everything that uh, anybody had to say. And, and I'm not doubting, but are, with your training and your credentials, are you confident that, that uh, your, uh, again, with your experience, that uh, what, what you say, you can all, you can all take it as, as a fact? Um, well, I guess the main thing is that it's not just me saying it. So it's you're not relying on me saying one thing and all the public health departments and all the agencies that are in, uh, interested in health of a community are saying something different. I'm saying the same thing as all of the American Academy of Pediatrics, American Academy of Family Physicians, Infectious Disease Society of America, CDC, Department of Public Health, and our local health. So, so they're, they're trained in virology. Yeah. Is, it, is that the area that specializes in, in this transmission of viruses? The, the most specialized group is, America, is the Infectious Disease Society of America. And they 100% support masking as a primary prevention for transmission of COVID. And do our local hospitals have qualified or certified with that credential? We have infection control folks who consult with infectious disease doctors who are in. So we are in Upland Hills, we're an affiliate of St. Mary's. So we consult with infectious disease physicians at St. Mary's for decision making like that. Are you certified? I'm not an infectious disease specialist. That's a that's a specialty that's separate from in the medicine of pediatrics. It's a specialist in viruses or in bacteria. And it should be worth pointing out just to everyone who's here that uh, we did receive a letter from uh, 11 physicians in the county uh, endorsing this, uh, the protocols that are proposed uh, tonight. Does anyone else have any questions for Dr. Box and uh, 
or Paul has been proposed by the admin team? Yeah, that's a question. I've actually, I've got a few statements. The thing I have a problem with is that one of the things I'm going to do. It's really malfunction. Here you go. Is that I want to please everybody and I'm compassionate to those who are fearful for their kids and I'm compassionate to those who are fearful for what the mass of the kids. And the one thing I have found in reading all of this and asking these questions as I think you're not certain I want to vote is in this letter from the 11 doctors that states and asked to be worn indoors by all individuals who are not full vaccinated. So the, I'm assuming that was changed. Yeah, the timing of that letter was just before the CDC recommended because of the level of spread that it would be escalated. And I agree with that. And I wanted to point that out because I believe, my own personal belief is this is not a natural virus. So I think we don't know. I think we can't pass this first match for the next four years. I think that a compromise is needed very much for this. I think you presented a nice compromise. My goal tonight is more than making anybody happy that's getting to the school. We've got options here on the table provided for national exposure to keep those kids in school. Um, my other concern is um, the, the idea of fearful children and bullying and what's going to happen if, if we have mass touch. And a lot of our kids are going to get direction from what their parents say. And when I walk in here, I'm certain there's a handful of people who thought, oh shit, if you're in the Oh shit, four of them will be in the And why is it in the And we have to be careful with the message we school our kids. Because we cannot create a bullying opportunity at school for those who are fearful. For those families who are fearful, you can't send their kids to the right side. You cannot create an environment where those kids feel like they're doing something. But we do need a compromise. So I'm going to make a motion that we adopt the classroom exposures portion of this, and keep masks optional, and create the matrix or create a matrix similar to what the city of Belmont on mineral point school community exposure and positives so that everybody knows when we reach certain levels that we're going to have where we are. You know, we are doing certain things and it's not a case by case basis. Understand mass logical means mass are close contact for 14 days, no question asked for this topic. It means testing for a various number of days for this time. And I think that is a compromise. And I think that's what it means. So that's my motion. Andy. You just clarify the motion. I'm not sure I completely followed. So very two, two or three bullet points. What are you making the motion on? My motion is that we accept this document with mass optional so the post contact uh, provisions remain vaccinated, unvaccinated, vaccinated, mass optional, return to school protocol is followed with masking for 14 days. Testing it here, here, which hopefully allows those uh, who are concerned for their picking their children picking up the virus, those who are parents of the new compromise. It's going to be a little boy.
He's gonna be a big boy right on my ever. Sorry about that. I think I just been ticked off. It does provide uh, some, some assurance that we are masking and testing those who have been on network. Like I said, I think we're not in a great compromise here. Uh, we're really sure that it does provide some clarification. So I am. My motion is to not get unvaccinated class when it's for this chart and the, the rules that determine close contact in this document, but that the board creates a matrix in the one on the back, the board creates one based on our school. And I don't think our children should be analyzed based on what's happening in our time. Okay. So the motion is to accept the post contact and quarantine protocol that's on page two under masks optional, uh, whether they're vaccinated or unvaccinated, plus making masks optional for students, for every for everyone staff. Okay. And uh and for the board the, and the admin team to what the board the admin team to develop and the board to um, approve a matrix based on parameters of transmission only within the school itself. Yes. Correct? The rules are received. Okay. Is there a second to that motion? And then we'll have discussion. Okay. Second member status. Okay. I think you can use the mic. I think it's working out. So, Andy, do you envision if kids do wear a STEM name, then we can make it by five? Go ahead, Colin. And that's fun during that. No, because that would be only for universal masking. If universal masking was in place. It, it looks, it says here on but disclosure or the person in the house, where it says either person not in the house is greater than six feet apart. Not at this point, that I'm assuming if both people are masked and within six feet, that is not this point. Okay. So the, the six feet distance is if either person is not wearing a mask. Um, so you have to be at least six feet apart from people if you have, um, so if you have a student who wears a mask and they have a student who sits next to them who's four feet away and they test positive, that person would be excluded if they're four feet away. If both are masked, they can be within three feet. The, the other thing, the other caveat I'll have is the admin team would need to speak to whether um, enforcement of masking is going to be possible for optional, the optional column for those people when they're in the 14-day quarantine. And if they cannot guarantee that there's masking required for those people during their infectious period or potentially infectious period, then the we can, um, it's not an option to do that in person quarantine. Why is this a Because it is a mask, an option if that person is masked and they come to school. But if the admin team has concerns about their ability to, to track and police that part, that becomes a concern. The other concern is sort of mask option. If, if it was a concern that we couldn't do that, why was it Because so the 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 true test of this is can we enforce these protocols? So if you have a single person in the elementary school and they have to mask, is that enforceable? Yes, right? Okay. But I would ask the admin team to speak to whether if there are, you know, if there's a football team worth of people and they have to quarantine, can we enforce that masking to the degree that we're protecting all the other kids around them? 
I guess that my rules are not as big, but it doesn't work. I can't wait for it. I won't ask much. Figure out what. Yep, and then the other thing is the distancing method. So you're potentially excluding more children because you we cannot maintain six foot of distancing in classrooms. And in some classrooms, we're even struggling to get three. But we're potentially providing them as much answers. You know, I, I'm, it's just not up to me, right? This is not my decision. My recommendation is if we if we want somebody to be in person for quarantine, they need to mask strictly. If we're not able to enforce that for that individual because we have a mask optional, then it shouldn't be an option for them to in person quarantine. They should be home for quarantine. So if there's if there's a mask requirement and you can enforce it across a student body, then not only do you have fewer people excluded because of the distancing, but also you have people being able to come in person and we know that they're reliably masking because everybody is reliably masking. Okay, so basically the question for the admin team is if masks are optional, but under this protocol uh, on the motion, um, quarantine kids will need to attend school masked. Uh, do, do you and your team feel comfortable being able to enforce and track that as far as identifying kids that have to be strictly masked in order to be on quarantine but in school? That, that would require that would require that would certainly start with you know, having that information provided to the proper building level authority, building level principal that a Susie in second grade is now positive wants to come to school. So now the school building would have to make sure that Susie is wearing a mask all day long. Just based on based on this recommendation. So I'll turn it over to my building level administrators to, to help answer that. So you're you're asking I'm mad when I went to the principal of the elementary. You're asking if the kid is positive? Close contact. Close contact, and but they were in that mask to be, I think, could we manage that? Yes. I don't know. I've never done that. It seems very complicated. Um, it will certainly take a lot more work to to find out who was and what was contact, and then and how do you enforce that throughout the day, especially for our kids in K2, K2. I mean, that right now, they, you know, they're. They're just kind of turn up at that age to really enforce that. It would be difficult. And it would be the same if we were to enforce it for the universal mask. The same thing would happen in the universal mask situation. The difference there would be that everyone's masked. Not awesome. Uh, I guess. From that standpoint, so it's a close contact. Um, I would find it difficult to make sure, but you know, you can obviously recommend that people are going to have to know which kids are in close contact. So they have to be in the classroom, that I can't be in the classroom and be at a nice the whole day. So it doesn't make the small of that kid around. I don't think it's difficult to try and be as small as the kid. I guess that's my take on it right now. Yes. Simple question. Yes or no? It can be done. Would it be easier to do this than it is to go back and do a hybrid model or a virtual work? Um. So it would be easier to follow a kid around versus being virtual or hybrid model. What's that? They would be, but they also have to teach. They would be, but they have to teach and focus on the education part of it too.
Get him on the mic. About this screen, that it's probably easier to um, look at the universe class because it's everything, right? It's not just I'm going to pick up suits because that's the most contact for me. Matt, you you know your kids if you don't, and if uh, if cases start to tick up. Could you, with an optimal mask policy, put the word out saying, could my high school kids wear a mask for two weeks? I think you would be surprised if asked in a nice way instead of all its demanding. You would be surprised how many kids would come to school with a mask on. On the mic. I'm, I'm not going to disagree that a lot of kids would do that because I have a very good relationship with those kids. You know, I'm, I'm not going to disagree with that statement. But then, and, I, and I would trust that if it's a close contact, or you can ask them, I would trust them. But I also know there are kids that are more often, it still could be more work on that side. That's all I'm saying. I'm, I'm not saying nothing. nothing. Right? Yep. I, don't, I was on them. I'm not saying it wasn't, but I, I do think, yes, at the high school level, yeah, I can ask most kids to wear a mask like that. So I will, because I know who they are. My concern is about that. Well, it, it would be a challenge, especially in the hallways. You know, uh, we've got a lot of kids during mask time. We've got to make sure. That's really when they're so close to each other. So staff would have to be notified. They'd have to be involved in being able to enforce it. So I think a big part of this is we're looking at it retrospectively. When there is a positive, we have to look back and say, well, who were they exposed to? Who have they been exposed to? I think it would be like another layer of taking attendance. You have to know, okay, well, so-and-so here today had the math. So-and-so here today did not have the there were people already concerned with universal masking that it's too much of an administrative burden on the teachers to make sure that they're wearing the mask. I, I think it would be it would be ludicrous to think we could accurately portray who has has not been wearing a mask throughout the entire school day. Looking back to see if somebody actually had a, a close contact or not, do it. Very good. I just think. I can just add one other thing that I'm thinking of, and I hope I say this correctly. Last month, or maybe the last two months, you guys talked a lot about not wanting to isolate, segregate groups of students based upon vaccination and unvaccinated. And by making it mass optional, we're automatically doing that because, at least from my understanding of the plan, those students that will have to mask at school if they are close contact are those students who are not vaccinated. Am I incorrect in that? Everybody. But we're still, but we're still segregating groups of students where if it's universal, it's not. You know, if we come back to the early elementary, we're pre-teaching those skills to everyone in the class, encouraging everyone in the class to do it the same way. If, if it's only three people in, in school that have to do that, those three people are going to be potentially a target of bullying or some of the things that you guys talked about. Andy, I have a question again about the motion. Um, at what point, if any, would we require masks? And I think that was kind of the to be determined. But if we hit a threshold, if, if we have, you know, half a dozen positive cases in the school or maybe two dozen positive cases or whatever it is, if we hit that threshold, would we then uh, invoke the universal masking column of this policy? We would, we would create a home matrix based on school population, similar to the Yes, so that would be part B of this motion, but would we at that point then revert to uni the universal math? That would be ready to be. And then it would be discretionary opinion, something that's set, it would be static, we get this number, 
like it or not, it's the number of percent you're wearing a mask. Okay, but then from a, a post contact perspective, from page two, and then we follow the universal masking column of the chart. Yes. Well, I got a lot of things to look down. Many things that I've accumulated over the last 18 months. And as I sit here tonight and I think back to late March 2020, we sat in that IMC Sunday afternoon and two medical professionals said many lives could be lost with this virus. And I believe them. That's why I reluctantly voted in favor of shutting the school down. At that point in time, I didn't know exactly what to expect, not only the district, but the community that I was elected to represent, that we were all facing. As a board, we decided on a hybrid model, which wasn't ideal or perfect, but it's better than 100% virtual. However, the teachers of this district suffered an immense workload to which none of them asked for, and us as board members put them through. I think about a special meeting held in December 2020, where a member was vocally upset that it was even a topic of action to return to school before Christmas, since we as a board just discussed it one week prior. And I have no issue with the anger in this moment because I feel that we had a point. I will openly listen and accept this position. However, what I don't accept is when the board decides that night unanimously that we will be going back to school in January, four days a week, possibly by February. Well, February didn't happen, and March didn't happen. And somehow it was brought to our attention that the current board president promised to both and get kids back in school. He did email a few months prior and miraculously was put back on the agenda in April. Did I raise my voice? No. Did I ask for the on the agenda? No. But we all knew. Nothing changed from the last 30 days of the previous school board meeting. Nothing. It's the, it the very same meeting when the board voted to return to school in the fall, five days a week with no virtual option. Now we get to the June meeting. Well, the words Delta variants was mentioned by two board members. The motion to disband the mask policy passed, which at that meeting, the superintendent, the middle school principal, instantly removed their mask respectively with smiles on their face. We go to the July meeting, the same people who preach about Delta variants and how much more deadly and contagious it is are the same ones indoors without a mask on, not social distancing. School medical advisor and school nurse standing literally right next to each other for at least a half an hour. And what we're told we have to mask up. I don't understand how this is acceptable in the taxpayers' eyes. And then the comments made that night that unvaccinated children should wear a mask, to which Mr. Dunn and Mr. Fox both agreed. And then we find out, uh, we find out later that night, somebody asked them, they said, no, you cannot force them. Well, 14 days later, we get this letter from 11 doctors saying that unvaccinated kids should wear a mask. I'm sorry, but I didn't see anything change in them 14 to 10 days. The numbers did not spike at that point in time that big. For the record, my personal position is not on that list, and I do know two others who are not on that list, which tells me that not every physical or physician or doctor is on board with what you're selling. Maybe we should have done a public survey about what we think we should do, whether to put masks on students or not. But since the last one was done and it was continually ignored the results of what the public wanted, we didn't get that option this year. And I find that disappointing too. I'm on record asking in January the number of absent students due to flu, cold, bronchitis, strep throat, etc. And amazingly, the number was zero. Sadly, I bet the number is still zero because we were told that everything is presumed cold. It's time to act as what we were elected to do. I sat in a candidate forum just like the rest of you. As much as some people won't believe it, I put education number one on my list of things that are necessary. 
I took the oath of a board member. The focus has been on children's education from day one and will remain the same. And people saying that board members don't care about children's safety is ridiculous. You don't know me if you actually believe that. I'm not going to give you CDC numbers because, quite frankly, I don't believe in any, but I am going to give you four numbers right now. The number 40, the number zero, and the number one. The number 40 stands for the amount of years I've lived in this community. The number zero represents the number of people that I know of that have passed away in the last 18 months through this virus. Now, if somebody had passed away, it would have made these premiums on the Democrat Tribune, but it never happened. The first one that passed away, I believe, from Montreal. Maybe front page news in the Dodge Macron. So it never happened. The last number is number one, and this is the one that's going to get ignored by a lot of people. Now, it's been talked about twice tonight by people up there, and Mr. Bush has referenced it lately. And quite frankly, I'm a little disappointed that we sat this with Mr. Spots for over an hour. It has never been discussed. The number one represents the one person who lost their life to COVID due to depression. This is a fact. There's a person. Who did what they were told? They trusted this person, they trusted that person. Now, they didn't have it. So this is on them, not on the doctors, right? They took the recommendations. They didn't go out. They abandoned all their friends. They didn't want family to see them. They didn't want friends to see them. It's muted, Gary. And that person fell into deep depression. I watched it every day. And you don't know how tough it is to sit at that hospital when your grandmother is dying of starvation because that's the only way she can get out of her depression due to everything that's taken away from her. I had to sit in that hospital before she died. I wanted to make sure I thank you for everything she left me in this life, how much I love you. You people think I don't have compassion. You're wrong. That's the one person that has passed away due to depression. Mr. Dunn, am I not correct on that? You can answer it. We said if anybody brings up personal medical information, it's open topic in a war. It's true or not. Yeah. Yes or no? Those were your words. The cause of them was complicated, and we should talk about this offline, Gary. But I'll, I'll let you make your statement. I did not get in this district for any political reason, but others in the district did not look at themselves in a mirror and say the same thing. It irritates me when people who make recommendations can't see that they are not following their own recommendations in their own lives. It's all hypocrisy. And I'll leave you with this. People tell us to trust this or trust that. In my opinion, trust leaves you injured, depressed, or dead. I prefer the word truth, but the problem is when I speak truth in this community, there's certain people that hate me. That's disappointing. When I've lived in this community for 40 years and I'm proud to send my kids to this district, I will never tell anyone what is best for their child. I do believe it's not my business to tell anyone what's best for their child. I know a lot of people aren't being elected here because we need to stop looking at fear. We need to stop testing. We just need to get back to our lives and be happy. Thank you. Does anyone else want to make a comment or have a question before we uh, vote on this motion? I just I just want to uh, be clear. Now uh, there were Gary. I appreciate that history over the last year. However, what I think we need to realize is that things change. And also, I'm sorry for your loss. Uh, I watched my mother drink COVID as well. I mean, people lost them. Lost people over the last year. So, okay, uh, but. You know, you brought up someone wearing a mask one one and one another, not another. I was vaccinated. And the best information at that time, I didn't need to wear a mask. Okay? I wore a mask as long as it was the policy of the school. Wear a mask. 
That's more than I can say about other members on the board who want to play these games. Uh, I mentioned that once before, and you seem to think that I was just picking on you or something, but, but it was a policy. And we are meant to follow policy. That's why I try to stay to the, the three minute limit uh, tonight as well. Uh, I have a real concern uh, when we start talking about looking at, at who says what. You know, you mentioned Dr. Fox a few times. Uh, Dr. Fox, as far as I know, is in agreement with the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Academy of Family Physicians, uh, and the American College of Academy of Family Physicians. Those three groups, and correct me if I'm wrong, make up the vast majority of people who care for children in this country. When we talk about being political, we need to understand those doctors have no political gain. Okay? There is nothing for them to gain from. So I see some people making money, uh, money, money. Uh, I, I don't know where you get your information. I don't think people, I don't believe doctors are being reimbursed for uh, lying on death certificates and saying what people have told them to do. I don't see there being any interest, anyone wanting to pay them for that for that matter. Doctors want to get back to their normal life too. They want to go home and sleep at night. You know, do you think they, they want to be in the hospital all the time? I, I don't quite understand it. I'm sorry if I'm getting a little off topic, but I think it's important when we just say, well, Dr. Fox said this, this is wrong. Actually, and some people are saying, Mrs. Fox, it's Dr. Fox. If you're in the, the professional, she, she studied hard, she went for many things. It's Dr. Fox. She's here as a medical professional. It's also Nurse Lindsay. She went to school. She worked hard. I worry about what we're telling our children. Why should they even go to school? Why should you go to school if the fruit of your education just having a bunch of people being angry with you? Well, what's the point? What's the point of school? So I just want to say that out loud. Um, and I do think, again, I can't think of any primary care physician coming alone on that list, but. I, I don't know I'm right there. Uh, but I just I, I feel it's important to point out it's not just local doctors. We have some, some angry people that is local liberal doctors who do this. And it's not. It is the entire profession of medicine. Uh, and it's not only in the United States, it's across the entire world. Okay? This is not just here. It's not just Iowa County. Nothing makes Mineral Point special. <laughs> That from coming, and that's that's all I have. I think it's hard to vote on this last on Andy's um, on Andy's motion uh, because we don't know what the limits be. Uh, we can't really vote until we know what the limits. Be. That's that's just okay. Thank you. Anyone else want to say a few words or ask a question before we call this to vote? Andy, I will, I will not be supporting the motion, and I wanted to talk a little bit about what I would like to see or why I want to see. I would like to see us accept the, the recommendation um, as presented, but with a few, a few modifications. I would like to see us remove the moderate line completely, and I would, so I would like us to have a kind of a low moderate category, and we'll the back page. A low moderate category, and then a um, substantial high category. So it's just an on or off for mass optimal versus mass is required. And then I'd like that data to be focused on uh, on the CDC zip code data as opposed to the countywide. Again, so that we're making decisions based on based on what we're seeing more local. Uh, I'm envisioning something closer to the Belmont approach. However, I do feel like we should be looking at positive cases even beyond the school walls. So I think that the one concern I had around the Belmont um, approach, um, and to do that as an example, was that they were waiting for a number of positive cases within the school, whereas I would like to consider um, positive cases basically within community members in the actual school district. So that's what I'm hoping to drive towards, um, and that's what I'm supporting. But I do think you for the initiative in the motion. Anyone else? Uh, we need to figure out what those numbers should be for us. Um, 
So I asked Dr. Fox previously about the county and looking at those. So for our county low, is it zero nine for our county low in the back? Should we be moving? It's be like under two and a half. Per right, it's, it's zero to nine per 100,000 people. Yeah, so, so those numbers could be adjusted. Yeah, so I would want to scale the low down to what's appropriate for our district, but I would like to keep the moderate column up completely and say low would be from zero to 49, the equivalent size down. I'm afraid I'm not making that clear, but I do see some nuts. Well, that might be Okay, so uh, we've had a motion amended to base the matrix on uh, community transmission data within the 53565 zip code rather than within the school itself. And did you also say to combine the low, moderate, and substantial and high? Yeah, but some other matrix. But you altered the motion, and I think the motion to say based on CDC data and sit in the minimum zip code instead of within the school. Is that being tracked by the CDC and can be followed by the public? That's what I thought. Left unmuted. It. it is available. It's um, being reported. I was trying to find it right now for school districts to be reported by Department of Health Services um, rather than CDC. I don't think CDC drills down with that low, moderate, substantial high to the school district. So it would take maybe a little bit of um, this map and figuring out to see how it's reported on the DHS site to see if this is just something easy to track and we can just say. If we're right on their map, then we're high, or whether it's something we have to um, calculate out and report on a weekly basis. Okay. Um, I'll have a, I'll entertain a second to the amended motion. Who second? Okay, so member Stavis, did you second the first motion, Okay. Okay. Right. So you can just second the second the amended motion. Sure. Can you talk into the mic so that I can hear you in the words? So you're concerning the, you know, is, is uh, we, we do a uh, cross-section of the community versus just school or positive cases, correct? Uh, okay. This may, this may never happen. Of course, I have to do clarification. So would a PCR test be a positive test and then it would be tracked in the community? Uh, PCR tests that are done for any public health um, department is required to be reported to the state, which is then drilled down into our school district and zip code. Based on the address, it's not necessarily going to catch all the People who are students in our district because of all the enrollment and things like that. I'm not um, inferring this, but is there a possibility of a bunch of people going to get a PCR test that are I'm just I don't want to label anybody, but that support mass to run the transmission rate up in Mineral Point? So we, and we're if they're positive, 
well, they were truly positive. If they've previously been positive, like already been, they only get counted as a right. as a once. And then there's also a percent positive that goes into some of these populations. I can't, I would have to dig into the DHS reporting to see if it's reported on here as well. But um, more false, tests. False, positive. false positives are, are a very small concern. And if we have one that we truly think is a false positive, we can confirm it with a separate test. So those tests would not affect our positivity if it's truly a false positive. That is a concern. Thank you. Would you like to second the amended motion? Okay, so yes. So second by member Stevens. Okay, any further discussion? Okay. Uh, I just want to make a brief comment that you know um, we are all exhausted by this pandemic, we're all exhausted, um, wearing masks, talking about masks, talking about close contacts, talking about quarantines. Um, we're exhausted tracking variants and mutations. Um, so I, I sympathize with the desire to just be done with it and just say it's not worth it anymore and what's the point and let's just not wear masks let's just not test let's just not keep people home and just come what may and let's just get on with our lives i i am feeling that uh in my core i promise you um but um as a school board you know we are tasked with um, doing our best to provide education to these kids um, as, as safely and responsibly as possible. And, um, you know, we have roles in the school all the time that kids don't want to follow. My kid can't wear a hat to school if she wants to. I can't, my kid can't go barefoot to school if she wants to. She will be turned away if she doesn't have shoes on. She can't wear a, she can't wear a hoodie over her head at school, even if she wants to. And I, I give my child that choice. If she wants to wear a hoodie around town, I don't care. You know, if she wants to wear a barefoot, then it's, it's her choice. But there's precedence for the school requiring certain things for kids to do and wear in order to be a student on campus and in school. And unfortunately, we have to debate the, the merit and value of masks in terms of how much does it improve the safety of the school as a whole versus how much does it on the student. And I'm contemplating, you know, worst case scenarios of universal masking versus optional or no masking. And if we have optional masking, and we, and we all know that, you know, if it's optional masking, you know, maybe some kids will start to squeer wearing a mask, but eventually they'll, they'll come off. And there will be very little masking if optional masking is happening. And so that, that layer of, of risk prevention is essentially gone. And, uh, you know, if we have an outbreak and a surge of cases like we had last year, and we have six staff, we have six students, we have people on our quarantine, and we have to go 100% virtual again. You know, I, I don't know if I can justify that risk, um, knowing that we all are sitting up here wanting kids to be in school as long as possible. And so 
I want to have the kids in school as long as possible. I want them to uh, be safe as a close contact so they can stay in school. I want them to not have to quarantine. And to me, after reviewing all of the guidelines from people I've trained with, people I trust in my field of public health and medicine, are all saying the same thing. And that is, if you are in a community where the transmission rate is high, like we're in right now, we need to do everything possible to mitigate spread so that it's not just keeping the kids safe, but it's keeping our community safe because it spreads at home and then it gives to people that are higher risk and then we have problems. So if I'm, I'm looking at universal masking and what's the harms of that? Well, we, some kids don't want to wear masks. There's kids that, that need accommodations because of disabilities that I think we can work around. Um, you know, there's kids that are annoyed about having to wear a mask. I, I get all that. That's, those are real issues. But the flip side is if we end up with a large outbreak that could have been prevented with universal masking and the protocols proposed tonight, and we decide not to do it, we end up with an outbreak that puts us all 100% virtual, nobody's going to be happy. And uh, I'm willing to take a slight risk of making a few kids annoyed that they have to wear a mask in exchange for um, preventing them from being really annoyed that they all have to stay home and be 100% virtual for potentially weeks on end. So in the name of uh, you know, doing what's right for safety, doing the responsible thing, um, I think any protocol we propose tonight has to include universal asking, as long as we are still in a high transmission rate. And if we develop a matrix that allows us to make mass optional as the cases lower, and they will lower. You know, we're going to have a spike of the Delta variant cases, and it's going to go down like it's done everywhere else. We just have to do what's right right now, ride out the surge of cases, and then as they start to come down, we can uh, look at removing some of these precautions. So um, that's my two cents, and uh, um, I'm not going to be supporting this motion because it, uh, it does not include that. So um, can we call a question, Angie, on this motion from Member Bush to... Um, to accept the <coughs> masks optional protocol for vaccinated and unvaccinated students on page two, um, development of a matrix um, for adjusting layers of measures based on uh, zip code uh, case data uh, and tasking uh, to have a matrix. Well, is that it, Andy? The matrix and the exposures, close contacts, and basically having masks option, correct? Okay. Yes, the matrix to be approved by the board. Okay, you can put that in the motion, sure. No. No. Okay, so motion passes four to three. Okay. Um, All right, so, and just to be clear, um, we have the Asking based governance policy. Um, so, unless someone wants to make a motion uh, to uh, re approve that policy, it will stay in repeal. Best way to understand that? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so um, the the question raised by our attorney is that uh, 
it's federal law to wear a mask on a school bus. Um, so, do we need a motion to approve that uh, policy? So there, there is no federal law or state law that requires the school districts to adopt a mask mandate indoors on um, in any other location or event other than a public school bus. The CDC has ordered that public school buses are public. Not a law. I did not say that it was a law, sir. I said that it was an order from the CDC that the public school buses are treated like public transportation. And therefore, in the event that you do not adopt a mass mandate in your buses, you will be in violation of the CDC's order. And my concern is not necessarily that you will be penalized by the CDC or federal government, but I am concerned about your insurance coverage or any transmission that occurs on the school bus. Because I have been speaking with a number of insurance companies that provide insurance coverage for school districts across the state. And in the event that you are not at least adopting a mask mandate on your school buses, you will likely not have coverage for any such damages that occur. So my recommendation to you is to consider the risks associated with not adopting a mask mandate on your public school buses and then make that decision based on those risks. I'll make a motion that we from the CDC order all students that are required to wear masks at the buses. I'm going to support this for a little bit of a lesser than any other. Solomon. 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 The, the CDC is not an authority figure in our government. They're, they're not elected by anybody. They are appointed. I don't, I don't know how they have um, the authority to be recommended. What I can tell you is it's not a law. I specifically stated that it was not a law. And I told you that I was not concerned about being penalized by the CDC or any federal agency related to the decision. What I'm concerned about is that there is a recommendation for there is an order out there from the CDC that if you choose not to follow it, insurance companies that are providing insurance coverage for school districts have indicated that you are breaching the duty to follow that order and they will not be providing coverage for any transmission that occurs on a school bus where there is damage associated with that transmission. I am not telling you that you need to adopt this order. I'm not telling you that you must comply with it. I'm telling you as a school district, as your legal counsel, to consider the risk and then make the decision accordingly. Whether the CDC has the authority to issue the order, I'm not commenting on that. I'm not suggesting that they do. I'm suggesting that I'm concerned about your public. And in the event that there is a claim, you will be paying for those damages from the school district's offers as opposed to the insurance public that you pay for on a regular basis. The email we got from our insurance carrier did it in the school bus. The email that I forwarded on was based on whether or not you would adopted a mask policy in, indoors, and EMC had said that they're telling, they're being told that they will cover any cases that come forward in that respect. But the buses, I, I have seen things from Strength Pass and I've seen things from uh, Mike Jell, who works for it. Mormon Clark. Clark. Clark, thank you. That that you do risk your liability if you're not following those guidelines and recommendations on school transportation. Sure, sure. Again, I really don't have a problem with kids wearing a mask on a bus, but when you have, uh, it's hard to find bus drivers. And some of our bus drivers are getting up there and not uh, engaged. And a lot of them are wearing glasses and you expect to put a mask on. Damn morning, they're, they're driving around the most precious cargo in the community. And here we are losing their division. Okay. So it, it, it's, it's small potatoes to me. I don't really care. But I, my, my last comment, uh, Sheena, I think it's a, a scare tactic from the CDC. 
any other comments or questions for this motion? Just on the, the, the topic of insurance, uh, you'll find out they won't cover it when it happens. That's when you find out. That's when insurance companies decide not to cover something that happens because you want to pass the rules. That's when you'll find out. And if, if you don't, that's, that's just how insurance works. Any other comments or questions on this motion? Okay, Angie, you can move all the questions. But, uh, yes, uh, Ms. Dalton said that the, um, this mass rule on school buses is on the WBA um, guideline policy, but that, that would only apply to sporting events. Correct, and this motion would apply to all events, um, regardless of school, to and from school, field trips, etc. Okay. Okay. Yes. 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 Motion passes. Okay, next we're going to talk about the WIA fall sports guidelines for COVID precautions. You guys all have a copy of that? I'll, uh, um, if there aren't any clarification questions, I'll accept a motion to approve these guidelines. Yeah. Deadline is passed, just some areas are stronger. In speaking with the WIA, they did mention local control. So whatever we adopt for our district. Yes. So, Member Bush, do you want to make that motion that we approve the guidelines, uh, except when our protocol supersedes the season? Would that be in there? I'll make a motion that we adopt the guidelines for the current season and for the next season. Yes. Yeah. 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 Any further discussion? Okay. Angie, can you call the question? Yes. 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 Okay. Um, before, I have done this one quick question. Do we need to uh, now? Look at the chart um, when masking is required when based on case load of five three five six five area code or zip code. You mean like in terms of developing a uh, matrix? Yes. Yes, I think that we can either decide to uh, put that together now in conjunction with the admin team and the medical team, or we could. Um, Task it to the admin team and have them present a matrix to the board for approval. I, I would suggest we try to do it tonight. I know it's a long meeting. I would suggest we try to do it tonight because school starts on the 1st of September. Many parents have already complained that they don't know what our policy is um, to start the school year. Okay. Um, so, in essence, right now, there is no policy. 
there's no way you're going to do anything. Right. Um, so, I mean, the, the current, we are currently in the high state transmission based on the zip code data. So, um, and I anticipate we, we're going to be there for a few weeks. So, I don't think the, the transmission rate will change any time in the next month or so. So, in that sense, we have a, a little bit of time. But uh, I don't know, Mr. Wainwright, you want to make a comment? Or well, I think you, you, have, you have, you know, when it comes to. Can you just clarify if there, I heard a couple of motions about this matrix, and I didn't hear if anything got landed on for when we're in. So, I heard Joni proposed that substantial high is kind of an on and small moderate medium off. So, nothing about the matrix was approved. The only thing that was approved is that the, uh, was that a matrix be developed um, based on. 53565 zip code community transmission data. So we would need to lay out, you know, um, how would those cases be defined? Um, what measure? And that matrix is to decide whether universal masking is required for the school district? I'm not sure. Is that, the, is that what you were intending? And there was a then in gross the logic that the three matrices we could be able to present it tonight. Local districts to follow me and come up with a similar matrix. With that triggering some sort of action on set, it would set specific guidelines for when we are in universal mass, when we are. So having that cut off for that, all of the, all of the um, things that we're doing to reduce our physical practice. So there is a potential that we're already starting in a level that would require masks. That would be the board of the center. But I think, again, I don't have any chance to do those after four hour charge discussion. Well, the, the matrices that were adopted by Schoenberg, Cuba City, and Belmont are all based on cases within their own school building. Right, and I just got the mind. Right. So, but still using that idea. That idea. Okay. So, I think the board needs to own information. I think the board needs to own information. I think the own policy, certainly with input, um, but I think we're setting static guidelines. That needs to be okay. So, I think we need to make we need to make the matrix. And then another thing I want to add. We are in school. Okay. So just to be clear, I mean, our zip code is currently at the highest possible transmission rate right now. And we don't have a matrix that suggests that we should. Okay. But I think we need to get together as a board to decide where we feel. Okay, so that leaves the potential. Like, like, are you is 2.5 pieces of Right, and that would be in the low transmission rate, correct? That would be the only time currently allow max to the high schoolers to have max. That's why I'm giving it their own based on the fact that it's a true optional max. This matrix eliminates, essentially eliminates the ideas, perhaps, the decision is we need to work for. Okay, so just so the public knows, I mean, there's a potential we could we could approve a matrix that requires universal masking based on the highest possible transmission rate. Uh, that would basically have to go into effect immediately because we're in the high transmission rate right now. But yeah, as soon as we adopt the matrix, whatever we have, we would adopt the starts. Okay. So we would need to decide this at a separate meeting before the start of school. I think that would be the point we have for Okay. All right. Um, 
I think the other thing to I think the other thing we need to consider is you know we've had a lot of comments from parents that if we don't have universal masking and we don't offer a virtual option to start the school year, they're going to find someplace else to educate their children. So now that we don't have a universal mask policy, we need to talk about whether we should offer a virtual option so these parents keep their kids in our school district. We've heard quite a bit tonight about parents will pull their kids. If we have a masking policy, a mandatory mask policy, and if we don't have a mandatory mask policy, and I've also heard a lot of concerns from parents that it's already too late. We we're making the decision tonight, they were mad that we were making the decision that how to lose the school start the soon. So my point, I, I just think we owe it to our community for them to really know what's going to be happening going forward, uh, not wait until the first day of school. I mean, that's that's like saying, well, you know, you'll find out. The first thing is, well, you'll find out, you know, if you're going to get any of your classes like one or not. We can switch classes and just do it over. That's my concern. Absolutely. And, you know, teacher orientation starts tomorrow, if I understand. So, um, staff need to be aware if, if we're going to offer a virtual option to keep families from leaving the school district, I think we need to discuss that now. Can this plan already offer that? No, this plan offers when we would pivot to virtual based on 30% absenteeism rate or inadequate staffing. It does not offer families to start the school year 100% virtual like we did all of last year. Yeah. Just we decided to be virtual understand it. It took us several months to prepare the virtual option last year. So we were hiring interns, uh, teaching interns uh, about six months ahead of time. Uh, unless we are looking to hire additional staff, I just I don't see how virtual instruction will be possible. I know how stressful it was last year for our, our staff and to vote to not have virtual and now you're gonna you want to switch to offer a virtual our staff is just gonna lose it you know i mean it's 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 very stressful yeah you know it's considered to be part of their jobs but as a board to agree not to have a virtual option. And now school starts September 1st, and then they're gonna scramble to get ready. That, that's a lot to, to ask. I would agree. Uh, that would be a lot put on a plate, uh, basically seven days out. Um, so I, I guess I wouldn't be in support of that kind of format. I think they're stressful for our teachers. I think it's potentially, if I'm honest, but I think it could turn a couple away and I'd be scrambling to find a teacher. I, 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 do, I do think that's a concern. I just want to point out uh, in my motion, which is that I'm out on the lines of both sides, is that I rate the fact that you might lose 40 kids out of our district. With either most, we didn't find a compromise. My hope is that this compromise means people in the middle, some of the uh, mask in place, and they don't have students. Now, again, remind those listening to those here, please give children empathy, avoid bullying of the mask students. We want to make this, you know, just for everybody needs to and their fears, and again, that was my goal was my middle option. I understand. Yeah, I just want the board to be clear that if we pass a universal mask policy, we really have no recourse to keep parents from leaving. But if we pass an optional mask policy, we have a recourse by offering parents.
it's a safe option for their kids who are concerned. And if we choose not to consider that or do that, you know, we passed up an opportunity to hold on to families and taxpayer money. I just want that knowing the board to sit with that. Um, and it's unfortunate that we're at this point late in the school year, um, but this is a serious ramification of an optional mass policy. Okay. Um, without any other action items, uh, I think we need to consider a special meeting to uh, develop a, a uh, board matrix of uh, layered measures. So um, we should have it as soon as possible, probably tomorrow night. Right. Yeah, post it. So we need how much notice? 24 hours notice. So we can have it as soon as Wednesday night. Angie, yes? Oh, 24 hours, thank you. Is it possible to contact those schools and identify school populations and know what percent they're using? One of them is based on percent. Two of them might be based on the number, you know, in cities, the number by building. Like the what percent? With some um, recommendation that maybe it will not be reinvented, there's cutoffs here that were proposed by another board member that could be tailored to our zip code. So we can have a case rate per week for 100,000 of 53565. Five, 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 five. And you could set the mass. Mandate mask optional at a rate tonight based on a chart like this, and then we can dig into the data. And I don't know that another meeting would be required. I think that's the thing that people probably need to know before school starts. The most of this are mass, mass yes or no. And so if you can say based on our case rates, um, you know, if we are in substantial or high, we're going to start the year of mask. And when we drop down to moderate to low moderate, then we are going to make that optional. That could be you know, a solution that would give people some information tonight that would not require them a special meeting to hash out the mass part of it, but maybe a special meeting to hash out any additional things in the policy that were not discussed tonight, because there was a lot of other policy things in this handout that weren't discussed at all. So um, and whether that would change or shift with the different levels. I understand. I appreciate that. I think we can use this, but I don't think this chart is a mass optional chart at all. It wasn't meant to be a mass optional chart. It was meant right. to say, here is a starting point. And again, I, I think I mentioned I felt like there were some places where you could pull or flex based on what the preferences of the board would be. So if you said low, moderate, mass optional, substantial high, mass required, that would be a starting place for the year. Um, and we have to dig to make sure that our what we've got for is a code data, but based on the fact that we are high right now for the county and the cases that I'm aware of in our district and zip code, um, I think that's going to hold true for our zip code as well. That would give parents some starting point for the year. Um, we're starting mass required. And, you know, if we drop down to a lower level of disease in the community, then we are going to relax that mass policy. But we're also going to have percent so the percent, you don't have to, you could, you could just, so this is the CDC definition of low, moderate, system, right. right? And if either one is above, then it throws you into a higher category. Um, so, you know, if you have only 10 cases per 100,000, but you have greater than 10% positive, you're probably missing a lot. So that should put you in that high risk. You could take out the percent positive and yeah, maybe even take out the, you know, the quarantine policy at the bottom and just have it be a mask policy with low and moderate being what being mass optional, substantial high being mass required, universal masking. 
um, and have the cutoffs be school district or 53565 five, specific. But that's that's the easiest way to break it down. Is we're looking at the data, the school district data is going to be real tricky to get the actual numbers that we can track. So the school this the uh, zip code data is um, available and very trackable this way. That was on the motion, Bob. Yeah. Kind of one that we lost a lot of our crowd and uh, I, I believe it would be in our best interest to meet the rest of Thursday night. A couple of basis points. You get the information from parents' schools and that percent of what can be referring to. Okay. Well, if if no one would like to make a motion to approve a preliminary matrix as proposed by Dr. Fox, which basically includes area specific case rates and masks only, combining low and moderate, substantial and high, in their quarantine adjustments. If no one wants to make that motion. I'm not saying that for it. Yes, because it's on the COVID protocol action item. Good question now. We're kind of backtracking a little bit, but it is on the action on the agenda. I will make that motion. Okay, we've got a Motion from Member Janetka to, sorry, to, do uh, you want to clarify? Um, to yeah. adopt the preliminary matrix. To adopt the preliminary matrix uh, with low and moderate 4535 zip code only being masked optional, substantial or high 435565 zip code only being masked mandatory. This isn't for how long it would follow the matrix. So it would be, it was, sorry, I'm just. It would be until we're in the moderate or low category for transmission rates, case rates in, in our zip code. This would become the matrix. Preliminary well, matrix, yes. So we can meet on Wednesday or Thursday to flush it out if we want to add any more layered measures or any more data. Or I can't hear anybody. Yeah. 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 Asking about how frequently those numbers are updated so that we can have that data. You see on that, um, it's a seven day average of a daily case rate. And so it's at least once a week. And the data that it's the most recent week. So you could say, you know, as soon as we go moderate, we can make that policy change. Or you could say, you know, once we've gone to this level for a certain amount of time, um, the, the tricky part is from the other direction where you have to re-implement a mass mandate if, you know, if the required amounts be as the numbers go up. It may take some time for teachers to prepare, students to prepare, making sure people know that they have to bring their masks, things like that. So it's so it's updated weekly as the answer to that question. Okay. And I think included in the motion, we should specify if we would change the layer the change the mask policy in the, the first time that a zone changes, or whether it's uh, you know, like as Dr. Fox recommended, perhaps waiting a week because there's a delay in data. I think we just need to specify if we're going to change it right when the zone flips or, you know, uh, after a week of it being in the same zone. Can I add an amendment to my motion then? Because yeah, there's no second. Yes. Yeah. So, so I would, uh, I move that we get this, these changes take place immediately upon cases rising and after two weeks, cases going down. Uh, 
Right, but it's it's really something that we're trying to decide for the sake of parents and teachers, specifically parents that are considering whether to open enroll their children in other districts or so find another the option. Uh, well, we, I don't think we can allow any public comment right now, but uh, um, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, we just need to get this sorted out. You asked a good question, Larry. So with where we stand right now in 53565, what do we do? Sarah's comment that probably is not going to We will be starting school with masks if this motion passes. So one thing. Larry, looking at the county level, looking at the county level, so not our zip code, um, I, went, I was able to quickly go back to April. And since in the last 16 weeks, Dave, this, this was rough, but we would only have two weeks where we would have been in that, in that masking zone, but it would be the last two weeks where we have 32 and 35 cases at the county level. So that, but that's county, I think, what we do. My concern with the numbers when we have one family for population. Does anybody know that the population is in Well, I uh if we have if we have 49 cases in the community or for 100,000, you know, and it's in moderate, right? What? Okay, the population of 53565 is 4765. So, so per 100,000, that's 20, a factor of 20. So, so one family, three that's where my concern is with this. This people. So you set the threshold higher, and you could you could say, well, maybe that's, that's that's what I'm at. Yeah. So you, I mean, these are these are based on again that CDC county level data. Um, but you know, if you said, well, three cases doesn't sound bad to me. In, in our school system, okay. So, Dr. Fox, one option would be to um, to lump substantial into the low to moderate. And have the matrix trigger universal trigger universal mass only at high transmission based on those cases. If I'm reading Mr. Bush right, right, Amy? Because you don't want a small amount of cases to trigger a universal mass policy, right? So if we're looking at based on a population and that small amount of cases in our zip code is actually that much more important than the cases in the county, right? So three cases in our zip code, um, maybe maybe more than that we want to change something. Um, I believe what it was the other in our zip code 0.8 per day. 
So multiply that by seven, you have five point six cases right now. For um, yeah, so that's uh, um, a in the mail school district right now. We're in the five point six five six five. So the daily case rate for the last seven days has been point eight cases per day in our zip code, and that puts us in the high transmission by the month. We cannot roll out to that data. So we, we got that from the CDC site. So I I know some details of the data, but we're not gonna have that level of data um, analysis that we'll be able to use. Um, you know, I I I think it's gonna be challenging. The smaller the population, the harder these numbers are. So we've had a challenge at the county level bumping from low to moderate. We, if we get down to low risk, then Eye protection is not considered required by CDC in healthcare settings. Well, low risk in our county is very, very low in terms of number of cases because it's such a low population compared to urban centers. So um, the smaller you make that pool of people, the more cases are going to make the numbers fluctuate. And it is an average over the course of a week. So it's not like three cases one day and um, zero cases the other day, three, three cases one day is not going to throw you up. It's going to be still the course of the week, but that would be average now. So, Andy, if it helps, does if we look low, moderate, and substantial? Um, if we use the substantial guideline, the 99 cases per 100,000, for us, that's five cases. The, five, the threshold is five. That five cases in the zip code, we mask. Anything under five would be free. Okay, Bob, you want to keep your motion as is? Well, I'm we would have been in the uh, we were in the low risk category for um, June and July, first two weeks of July. Went to moderate, substantial, high in the last four weeks because of the very rapid rise in cases. So if we would look back, like Joni said, it would have been um, potentially based on county data. So that was where you may be better off using county data because it's a little bit larger population. Um, we would have spent most of the spring in that lower moderate risk and even substantial. If you include that, that would have been um, probably from just guessing my numbers, probably from late February through the end of school year, would have been all in that um, optional masking if you set that cut off at that high risk. It is unfortunate. There's no doubt about that. Um, but it's not made up. Okay, well, I mean, they make a valid point. We have a motion on the table. Um, if it wants a second, uh, having a vote on preliminary matrix tonight. I'll second it. Okay, so any further discussion on this motion of a preliminary matrix? Okay, Angie, call the question. Yeah. No. No. Yes. Yes. Okay, so that motion fails. So, but, so go ahead. Okay, 
right. So the suggestion would be to meet on Thursday night, the 26th. I request approval from the board to be Okay. Um, can we agree on the on Thursday the 26th? Is everyone okay with that? Okay, so we'll have a special meeting uh, back here uh, 6.30 on the evening of Thursday the 26th. And um, do we need to approve that Virgin Angus request to join remotely? I think we, should, we had like that emergency pandemic policy that allowed any board member to join remotely. Correct. So you don't need to approve it because you're still under that. Go ahead and down. Yeah, so any board member can join remotely. We'll probably be in the library and I'll set up the Zoom. Okay. Tentatively, we'll be held in the library. Okay. And we'll have a, a Zoom option for people to participate from home. And we will have a public comment period. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, motion to adjourn. Cephas, second. Eisner, all in favor? Aye. Anyone opposed? Thank you all for coming. Thank you online.